Hello, everyone. Welcome, welcome. Happy New Year. How is it 2022? Uh, but I'm kicking off the New Year right <laughs> with my friend JL. Uh, we're going to talk about. I got my copy. Oh my God. Oh my it's God. so pretty. Isn't it so pretty and sparkly? <laughs> uh, this is JL's new book, The Sequel to Wings of Ebony. Um, and I mean, Jay and I talk all the time. But I have all these questions I want to ask and things I want to talk about because you do all these things amazingly. And I'm, I, I admire you. That, that sounds really like weird. It is but very mutual. I right? have questions. We're going to talk about lots of topics. Uh, you suggested like write our goals because of timing. But then we're going to talk about writing sequels. We're going to mm -hmm. talk about you straddle many different areas. YA, middle grade. You're doing some nonfiction um and like i think you should write adult as well we're just going to talk about all, all the things and then i want to i'm going to for everyone in the chat if you're wondering about marketing i'm going to grill jl on street teams so <laughs> i just rambled on but do you want to formally introduce yourself to the viewers who sure, are on the channel before so i can't thank you for having me on i mean like you said we talk all the time alex is one of my <laughs> Dear friends, so I'm always excited to come and chat about all the things books and writing and publishing. Um, uh, as Alexa said, I am the author of now two books. Um, this one, wait, pink one. This one, which came out last year, Wings of Ebony was an instant indie and New York Times bestseller. And then the sequel to it comes out in nine days, which is Ashes of Gold. The hardcover is just like my copy has just arrived. I actually just posted my Oil. unboxing this morning. I know. And did you notice how on the face, like depending on how you look at it, it shows you? Oh, different. isn't that cool? Like, can y'all see that? I I love shiny things on book covers. I'm so easy. And the naked is really pretty too, if you haven't looked under it. So anyway, I write these two books. I also write several other things, but they're not out yet because publishing exists in the future. Um, always. Oh my god! Isn't that pretty? <gasps> that is so pretty. I love a pretty book. I love they, a good naked book. Look they, at did that. So good. they did good with both of them. So if you're like, well, do I just buy Ashes or do I get both? Because I don't have both. Let me show you on Wings. Like, oh, we're, we're, oh, nice. We're book, really, I remember that now. Yeah. We're book nerds. So like we care about this stuff. Yes, we very much care about these things. My, um, my dream of life. Someday I want embossing on a naked book. Someday I will get it. Yes, you will. Yes, you will. They don't really do them for thrillers, but maybe we'll see. <laughs> One day, I feel like it is kind of a fantasy thing, isn't it? Yeah, it's really fantasy that. and sci-fi do it a lot because it's usually like a symbol, like something like like that. So no, we talked. I mean, <sighs> oh, God, you love a good right? <laughs> like. You want to talk about a naked cover? Yeah, they definitely, they, I love this one. It's probably one of my favorite. That's nice. Wow. It's oh, like, man. Oh, the integrate. So anyway, I do a lot, I do a lot of writing mentoring as well. I, um, I've been an author mentor, match mentor a few times. I've been a pitch wars mentor, but I tend to take my mentees in and hold on to them for life. Like they're stuck with me. So my mentees that I have attached myself to <laughs> um, are still kind of, you know, we still communicate. I still read their next works. I, we just, we create sort of a, a relationship so they can get insight to sort of what's next because the publishing journey is so much more than just like preparing to query or just executing a draft or revising a draft. It's it's truly a, a journey that's encompassing of a lot of different phases. And so I like to be there for my mentees for all those phases. In fact, my first mentee, their book comes out uh, February 1st. And then my second mentee's book comes out in May. So I'm actually seeing like, these are people I met two years ago through AMM actually, and their books are coming into the world. So it's kind of fun. Oh, you're one of my MVPs. I mean, you know that. <laughs> like, people have questions, I send them to you. <laughs> and when people are like, can I can I take two? I send them to you. <laughs> I gave you the speech. I was like, can you handle it? I trust you if you say you can. And you can. It's a lot. <laughs> I now have like my mentees and I have a group DM on Twitter. It's called Queen Squad. And it's really fun. Uh, we talk, we try to do like Zooms once a year. We send gifts. We plan little special things around each other's releases. Just creating community. Because for me, writing, like I would not have books coming out if it was not for 
a, a writing community, which for me is a hundred percent on social media. I mean, I met you through social media. Amazing. So um, I'm a big fan. I'm a big advocate of finding your people and connecting with them and like linking yourself arm in arm and getting through this, this sort of publishing journey, one step in front of the other. Cause it's yeah. it can be daunting, I think. Uh, but just briefly promote yourself. Like, Pitch that middle grade. Like, tell everyone. Oh, I'm so excited for it. Now, my middle grade is announced. So that one, if you look on Goodreads, you'll find a description. You will not find the cover. It has been finalized, but they are planning a reveal. And you haven't said it to me. We're gonna have a separate conversation. <laughs> now I'm in trouble. Um, but it's okay. So it's the first ever inner city magic school book. So it's about Kiana, who lives in this inner city community called uh, Park Row. Wait, Park, East Park Row. I have rows in both. Don't you love when you can't remember your own books? Because that happens to me all the time. Them. Like my YA is East Row, and then my middle grade is Park Row, to just kind of like a little Easter egg. But so sometimes I feel I confuse them. But Park Row. So that's where she lives, and she discovers that she's a witch when she turns twelve. And um, the way she discovers it is incredibly hilarious. And she has to enroll in this magic school that she goes to on Saturdays in the back of her beauty salon. So like her hairdresser has been a, has been a witch this whole time and she had no idea. Um, so it's just, it's, it's very much about magic in the real world, like magic sort of in your everyday life. It's very contemporary grounded, very accessible. I think fantasy lovers and contemporary lover, lovers will love it. And I tend to write books that are pacey. So um, it's not scary by any means, but it is very much a page ter turner. Um, and it's full of a lot of heart. So magic schools, there's there's a um, one of my favorite quirky parts of the book, because it's quite whimsical, is that the uh, in this magical secret magical school world that's sort of grafted into the real world, the security in this magical community is handled by a, a squad of ferrets. And they have little pointy silver badges and they're very serious. They sound cute and furry, but they're actually a little intimidating. So um, <laughs> it's quite a silly book. If I always... I always liken it to reading this book is like eating warm chocolate chip cookies. Is what I that's what I say. Yeah, I don't read a lot of middle grade, but when I do, I like the whimsical ones. Like I love that tone in a good middle grade series and like magic. My goal was to make people laugh because my mm -hmm. YA tends to be very dark and gritty, which I love. And with my middle grade, I just wanted it to be one of those books that you just you feel good when you're reading it. So you will get oh. your copy. You will get an arc. I will make yeah. sure. <laughs> well, and and I imagine you also feel good writing it, which is oh, also totally. Awesome. You know, I cool. I spit out the first draft of that thing in nine days. <laughs> I wish I could draft as fast. It was it was trash. It wasn't trash, but it Doesn't wasn't matter if it's trash. It exists. I know, right? I know. You it's like? I mean, you like editing too. Like, I love. I love writing. editing as well. So that's the good part. Yes, but it was. I think it was an indication, you know, writing is so therapeutic for me. And I feel like for a lot of us, it can be an escape. Mm -hmm. And I actually wrote this book when I was on sub with my debut because I had given up hope mm -hmm. that my debut Wings of Ebony was going to sell. And I realized I'm either going to refresh my inbox every five minutes and like lament and drown my sorrows in uh, Pinot Grigio and um, Rocky Road. Or oh, we have very diff. We have similar wine tastes, but very different ice cream tastes. I'm learning. <laughs> yeah. We'll or, be on a retreat in the future. These are yes, good things we to know. I'm excited about this. We should. This should be a 22, 2022 thing for sure. But it was either that or it was break up. This is some, something I always tell writers: break up with your project. It's not a bad thing. Mm -hmm. like, it doesn't mean you don't love it. It doesn't mean that you are done with it. But in your heart, if you're too fixated on your work, you can't make it as best as it can be. And yeah. so I needed to break up with my projects. And once I did that, the way I did that is I started a new project and I just poured my heart into, it's called A Taste of Magic. I realized I hadn't said that yet. It's called A Taste of Magic. Again, it's on Goodreads um, and the cover will be revealed early this year. It comes out in August. So uh, is it appropriate for a nine-year-old? Oh, absolutely. And this one, you know, there are some middle grade books that I think you give to your kids to read and you love that they're enjoying it, but you're like, yeah, I just don't get it. The humor just over my head. Like I just, nine-year-old humor doesn't get me. 
But then there are middle grade books that you can really enjoy as an adult. And I specifically wrote this as a book that families could read together. Like you literally can read chapters together and they will be cracking up for one reason and you'll be laughing for a completely other reason. <laughs> That's what I love about some of the Pixar and Disney movies is that there's yeah. like humor for all the audiences. I love so that as well. Yeah. I think it's a fun galvanizing story. Um, well, so generally, because, you know, you do all the things. Like, I don't think people realize. I mean, some people who are here might realize you do all the things. Which you so, say this, but you, I mean, this is kettle to pot here. I do different things. I mean, in fairness, we, I think we're, we're very oh, similar personality wise. But I think we, are. We, are. We, we take on too much. We're a little extra. <laughs> but because um, well, we get each other. Yeah. Well, we're pragmatic, which is we like talking about the industry. Yeah. Um, like y'all don't even know, like. I'll like we talk for like two or three hours and I keep you up. I like you're in bed oh, and I'm like talking. I'm still on West Coast time in my spirit. In your in your in your soul. Um but like I find it so fascinating. Like, can you talk a bit about like strategic career wise? I mean, there's obviously the practicalities of literally writing in different categories. Mm -hmm. But how did you approach it? Because you're strategic like me as well. We get along for so many reasons. Um selling YA and selling middle grade. How did you um, approach that conversation with your agent? Um, do you have like tips? Like what do you like what do you do when you have to jump from YA to middle grade or even because um, you have a I, I teased it you have, you have a nonfiction project. You're co-writing a real thing that's yeah not so weird exactly. with, with someone. Um, how do you jump around and, and manage those problems of your career? You know, it's, it's helpful that my attention span is that of a fly. So, that, you know, it jumps around naturally. Um, so I, I do think that, honestly, it's not going to be the same process for everyone. For me, uh, when I tire of one thing, the way I refuel myself is by jumping into something else. And so I really am kind of bouncing around these different things and trying to you know, when I when I'm tired or burned out drafting, then I jump into revising. You know, when I'm I need to give my fiction side of my brain a rest, I pour in creatively by looking through nonfiction and stuff like that. So I bounce around like that just based on kind of my energy and mood. But then in terms of like career wise, I did try to at least have these books come out in different seasons. I love the middle grade space. My kids are middle grade age. I don't know if you know that, Mike. They're middle grade readers. Yeah. Oh, and I so see them in the background when we <laughs> talk. <laughs> to be able to write books for their age group, like write something that my kids can read is just so, like it just means the world to me. So I knew I wanted to write in that age group. And I knew that the more, I don't know if people realize this, but once you, you, it feels like before you get a book deal, you're like, I am going to have so much to do. I, I'm sorry. You're, you're thinking like, I have so much to do now before I get this book deal. Like, I just need to get these words out. But in reality, you have more time before you get a book deal than after you get a book deal. Oh, 100%. Because you, you, once you're on the publishing schedule and you're like on the routine of churning out a book every year, depending on the age category and genre, um, it's hard to find that creative space. So I thought, I know I want to write middle grade. I don't know about timing. I need to, to break up with my YA right now. So let me do something that feels good, that is fun. And that's where my middle grade was born. I did not know when I finished it and let my agent, I'm not actually with that agent anymore, but when I let that agent read it at the time, she was absolutely certain. She's like, this would sell. Like it would sell like this, but you know, let's do some revisions first. So I decided at that point, Now's a good time because I didn't have an offer on my YA to toggle between both. So why don't we try to go out with the middle grade and see if we can get that in one season? It was in spring, but then the Panini pushed the entire supply chain world behind. And so now it's like the very beginning of fall, August 30th, which I guess is like late summer. But And then my YA is, or at least these YAs are in the winter time. So they're, they're separate seasonally so that I can at least give them each focus and energy on social media and promoting them. Um, and then one of the way, one of the best ways that I actually get into the headspace of writing is to give myself different sections of time to work on each project. I do not bounce between my middle grade and my YA on the same day. I will set apart, these are, these, this month is for my middle grade. This month is for my YA. I, I, I could, if I absolutely have to bounce between, but I, I worry about how those would bleed into each other, like voice and stuff. 
So I, I compartmentalize my time. And when I get into my story, particularly my YA stories, because the world's a lot bigger, I get deep into it. And I don't even think about my middle grade. If I get an email about my middle grade, it's like, I cannot do anything. But like, you have to protect that creation process, that creative process, um, really protect it so that your your voices and stories don't blend together too much. Yeah. That said, I do think having a cohesive brand across all of those is really smart marketing wise. And there yeah. is a through line, I think, in all of the stories that I write and all the stories that I want to write. Um, you know, it's not coincidence that both my YA duology debut um, is an inner city, is a book about an inner city girl. It's a contemporary fantasy about an inner city girl who learns she has magic. And my middle grade debut is similar. Different tone, different story, entirely yeah. different magic systems. But um, you are establishing a readership, you know, and so you want readers to begin to understand what to expect from you and somehow also not be bound by that, which I think is, is something else that I'm trying to figure out how to yeah. master. <laughs> It's hard, but I, I mean, I do, I do agree. Like I haven't done it yet, but you know that I have similar thoughts about like when I go into adult, but that said, like, cause I want you to write adult as well. And, I like, write adult badly. You know that. Yeah. Like don't feel too bound to your friend. Cause like, no, I I some ideas, but I'm really excited. <laughs> I think an adult, I want to do a slightly okay. different pen name and I just want to lean into a whole different. And it also depends on what your YA is to adult. You don't worry about your middle grade to adult. Not really. No, like, right. They don't really bleed. Yeah. I think tonally, like when I think about my next YA series after this duology, um, I think it's a nice bridge because there's crossover appeal in Wings of Ebony. But in my next series, I think it definitely has even more crossover appeal. Yeah. I mean, Which I know one? all the secrets about you that. You know all the secrets. I, I just love, the, I love the idea of that one so yeah. much. It's really, you know. I'm polishing off revisions on the final first draft. And um, it is by far the best thing I've ever written. It's not perfect by any means, but it is compulsively readable, which is saying something at 140,000 words. Like it's a page turner. Wow. <laughs> um, ooh, here, this is just, this is a, it's a general question, but also kind of a, a applies anyway. You've done, done this many times. How does it uh, work with being on deadline and getting paid? Um, does the publisher pay you to devote that time to getting your next book written or are you on your own until it sells? That is such a great question, Jesse. We're and both between books. Like we're both like right. on the bubble, so we can talk about this. It's just so smart that Jesse's asking questions like this. Like I wish I was thinking of questions like this before I had a book deal. Um, it really, I mean, it depends. So it's gonna a lot is gonna vary depending on where you're at with your contracts, what your option clauses look like. If you sold on a full, meaning like a whole draft, a completed book, or if you sold on a partial, like 50 pages in a synopsis. Um, some books sell on a concept if you're an established writer. So it really depends I on wish. Could I sell on a concept, please? I know, right? One day. Well, you're going to get there. Reference. My editor, my editor, my agent being a professional, like, you should probably write some of this book and figure out what happens in it. I was like, that this is an attack. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> She's correct. But now you know what I've been doing for the last uh, month. I'm excited. I want to hear about your next project. You know, I love all your goodies. I get to read them early. I'm you spoiled. do. This next one's kind of a barn burner. It's like a lot of terrible people. Oh, like, I'm going I ping pong back and forth. So I am very interested. You, you know, in Pretty Dead Queens, they're not ho all horrible people. No, but Pretty Dead Queens <laughs> is so delicious. Like, I cannot wait for that book to be in the world. It's so good. And it's just paced oh. well, which is like my my candy is when a book is perfect. Oh, thank paced. you. I don't care how long it is. It can be short or long. It's about making the reader not want to put it down. And you are a master at that. Thank so. you. Sometimes I really fail, but thank you. <laughs> Though you haven't read my draft zero. Someday you should read one of my I drafts. Should, I have read <laughs> early drafts though. I have alpha read for you on um, Ivy's. True. Though oh, you, you right. still read a, a version that was decently well paced, but anyway. <laughs> no. Uh, I, you know what? We're writers. We nag ourselves. And maybe we shouldn't do that too much and learn to take compliments. Thank you. We're done with this in 2022. We're going to accept compliments. We're going to try. We're going to oh, make okay. it. An attempt will be made. 
the way payments work, sorry, my allergies are terrible. Um, so my eyes. I'm, are I mean, I have a deviated septum. So on every live, I, I have the tissue and I worry yes. people think there's something wrong with me. If, <laughs> if anyone ever wanted to know, I have a really deviated septum. So my nose runs at all times. <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. My eyes <laughs> leak regularly. Um, so, okay. So it depends on your publishing payment schedule. Usually in contracts, they're, I mean, being paid on signing is pretty typical. There's a payment that you get on signing. Um, another typical time to get paid is delivery and acceptance or DNA as it's nicknamed. And that's when your book is, is done and just needs to be copy edited. Although I've heard some publishers are doing DNA post copy edits now. Are you hearing that? I know, oh, right? right? Yeah. Well, I'm not surprised. I'll tell you something I heard. I, I talked to someone who she gets um, DNA on a first draft. And I was like, just for completing the book, I guess it's like wow. a proposal thing. And I was like, interesting. It must be really good. I hadn't heard of that before. And you know, yeah. I've been around for a while. So I guess That's some, really cool. in some cases you can get that. More power um, to them. It's good because it gets you paid sooner. It does. Uh, but yeah, no, for me, DNA is after line before copy. So. And, you know, some people get a payment on release and some people get a payment after release. My first book. Penguin Random House. Not good. My, bless first, them, bless them. my first book, my final payment was on DNA, which was really cool. So I got paid everything before it even came out, which That's is awesome. Nice. So a lot of it depends, Jesse. But no, in terms of like, are they going to pay you to work on that ne next book? No, they only pay you for what they've agreed to purchase. Um, and what you, what they're con contracted to pay for. And it's usually, I mean, unless there's some fancy contracts for those, for big fancy authors, but I haven't seen anything that allows them like pay for working on the next project. Um, but that said, you can potentially, so where this gets kind of gray is that when you sell, for example, in a two book deal, yeah. technically your second book in that deal is not written. It's just a concept. And so technically you've been paid a part of that already upon signing and then you get yeah. the rest, you get another installment during DNA. So it just kind of depends on yeah. if you sold in a multiple book deal or not. Yeah. So like, I mean, both of us did two book deals on our mm -hmm. first ones. And so exactly the second book, technically like we were being paid to write and we were on a deadline already yeah. receiving, having received some monies. Yeah. And then I sold the Ivy's, um, I mean, that was just a fresh sub, but I sold that as a complete book. Mm -hmm. So like normal payment schedule. So I I wasn't paid to write that. I had to write that on my own and then go out with it. Um, but then the Pretty Dead Queens, I sold on proposal. Mm -hmm. So I was, I mean, I happened to write like hundred pages of it when I sent it in. I, I, I had it, so I sent it, but like, so I was paid on signing on contract signing. So I technically wrote that. I mean, I def I wrote it on a deadline with some monies having been paid. But like I had to finish it and make it acceptable to get mm -hmm. the next payment. Um, yes, <laughs> there's two, two more ahead. I'm new to this this system. This this pay on release. I've never had a pay. Oh, on it's day. PRH. Apparently, like they've done it for a while. They did it pre-pandemic, and a lot of people are unhappy with it. Um, yeah, and HMH did pay on release as well. So like my first two books were three broken into three payments per book on signing DNA on release. And then uh, PRH is four for me. Uh, but yeah. some publishers, including apparently PRH, but I don't have this, are doing like five. So, yeah. Sorry, a little bit. And my eyes are leaking, is getting aggressive. So I had to bring <laughs> in some tissue. Um, my fingers weren't cutting it. Um, yeah. But yeah, so it really does vary. That's a great question. I'm glad it's so cool that you're thinking about that ahead of we time. We got some really good questions. Um, oh, and so someone else just asked about advances, and we we just covered all of that. Good. We kind of rolled that up together. Um, well, so I answered an earlier question from this teen writer, but why don't we talk like a little bit about um timelines and like advice for this young writer uh david is under 18 
um, I already put in a comment, but I'll just say it for the live because your previous question was about can you get an can can a young person get an agent? Yes, a young writer can absolutely get an agent. We've both I think worked with pretty young writers before in like mentorship. Um, my personal advice: um, don't put your agent in the query. Um, I have seen some agents bless them. I mean, they 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 mean well. I've seen them be like weirdly ageist toward young writers where they'll be a little bit patronizing where I don't think they would be if they didn't know that the writer was young, um, meaning it can work against you as much as it can work for you. Um, meaning impress them with your book. If you've got a great book, it doesn't matter how old you are on either end. Cause someone else followed, asked about you know, what if you're in your thirties? I mean, I'm 38 now. So strange. Um, and I think I was 33 when I sold my book, 34. I don't know. I, was the same, I think, right? 30, I like, 30. What is time? Um, but so just be careful. But like, uh, like polishing is very slow. So gen generally speaking, my advice for this this question and, and all people is um, hopes and dreams are great, but like try to like just temper your ex expectations. Jay mentioned like breaking up with a book so that you can like emotionally like handle like you were waiting for sub, but um, querying is is like. Oh, it can it can take honestly like realistically it can take multiple books in many years it took me for, for most i think it does yeah for most people three books and i didn't finish my first one till i was 29 and then querying what is time what is even time brightly burning actually queried pretty fast uh, but that was 2016 like three months two three months um but i was on sub with that for eight almost eight months um and at the time that was a long time that is now almost standard for a lot of people so it just it it's so from the time i finished my first book to the time i had a book on the bookshelves for me five years five years four years five years four or five years jay what about you <laughs> i don't know that my experience with that is super helpful because it was it was atypical but so magic I, is I great too. we love magic stories as well you you followed your dream out here I want to give David realistic expectations. This is not to say that those things can't happen to you, but like Alexa was saying, temper your expectations. Don't go in expecting those things to happen. My biggest advice is to go in committed to the craft because at the end of the day, if you are a writer, which you are because you're writing books, you're going to persist. If you persist and continue to hone your craft and query these books and put them in agents and boxes, you will end up getting better and better and better at what you're doing and an agent will take notice. The only way that it doesn't pan out or more, most of the time, the reason it doesn't pan out is because a lot of people um, stop. They stop, they stop pursuing it. And I mean, there are also other obstacles and barriers there for different marginalized people that, that make it even harder. Um, but what the I want you to know is fickle as well. Yes. yes. Yeah. And I feel like publishing has not been as a side topic. Publishing has not been super open to um, stories outside of kind of one tone. I think they're getting a I've little bit better than that. I'm definitely concerned. I'm I'm seeing a, I, we saw a little blip of risk taking and I'm seeing a little less risk taking recently, which always bums me out. I like risky buys. I like weird books. I think that's how we find the next new thing. Like I like weird genre mashes and like, and, but I do think we'll recover. I just think we're, we're in a, like a pandemic related, like austerity mindset currently. Yeah. Yeah. I can see that. And, so I think, David, instead of putting a number on it, um, because, the I mean, a friend of mine just sold their debut. They were on sub for 19 months. That's almost two years. That's amazing. Um, and in that time, they've written multiple other books. Um, yeah. And their agent stuck with them, which is great. So all that to say is instead of focusing on the time, focus on getting your story as good as you can get it. I completely agree with Alexa that I wouldn't disclose age unless they want to get on the phone call with you is probably important for them to know at that point that you are a minor. Um, but keep working on your story. What you don't want to do is write it, throw it in the query inboxes too prematurely when it's not where it needs to be writing wise. So give yourself space and time to read a bunch, pour into your creative well, practice your craft, get feedback from other writers. That's really important. Like feedback is great, but if you can get feedback from other people in the same industry, it, it tends to be more helpful. Um, and just keep getting that story as strong as you can get it. And when you've got it as absolutely as good as you can get it, query it and start working on the next thing. That's um, my advice to you. 
And uh, of course, uh, consider submitting to author and her match. I forgot about the yeah. thing that I do. Uh, submissions open. I soon. know this January January twelfth. Like in in like next week. They open very soon, David. <laughs> Which just reminds me, I have I have so many things to do. Anyway, <laughs> I'm here. You know that. You know that we're tackling this together. I have to start letting people into inboxes. It's a whole thing. Well, that's so um, fun. I want to go spy. Oh, it, it, I do love submission. <laughs> it's really oh, fun. fun. I have total FOMO, but since my book comes out the day before apps open, yeah, I, yeah, I, I basically forbade you from mentoring. <laughs> I was like, no, you're not allowed. You, even though I love you. Um, and, and I just want to like, I want to say thank you, David. And then Jay, some compliments for you. Oh, Sue. Sue about Sue TV loves your series. Oh my goodness. Sue, so thank you. Oh, that's we're so just, sweet. We're, thank you we're accepting compliments in 2022. It's very yes, strange. we are. Without making excuses, we're just going to accept them. I'm so bad at that. We're still going to make excuses. We were like, socialized this way. Like, 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 literally, you said that you thought my pacing was amazing in Pretty Dead Queens. And my first thought is, no, no, I have to warn people. And this is actually true. It is not a thriller. It is a mystery suspense. And it is paced like a mystery suspense. Yes. And so if you go in expecting a thriller, it will actually feel slow. But thank you. I do feel that the, the mystery up, pacing feels right. own is very well. Because I, I did not realize that your second book wasn't going to be a thriller until you It's so me. different. I, I, I don't. I just, a mystery, but I love so I many. I worked it out. They love mysteries and thrillers. Like, I feel like they share an audience a lot of times. Yeah. And because you have that suspenseful tone, it's also just really delicious. Like, it's just good. Oh, I'm so excited. When it, what is your date again? When does it come out? I don't know if it's official. Uh, the, if I can say, except that it's it's October 2022. Like, I don't know if I'm allowed to say the date. I don't even know if it matters, it's but it's October 2022. That's such a perfect fall book. Uh, yeah, I, I, it's set, it, the action starts on like October 8th or something. Oh, so okay. I'm like, it's kind well, of when you hit that, that nostalgic season in like the school year and like the things going on in the book is similar to what's going on. That's perfect. And I'm just like, it's got rain, it's got trees. What else do you need? That's what I like. <laughs> It has that like stars hollow nostalgia. Yeah, that's definitely like the small town feel. That's that's um here's just a, like a good interesting like question. Um, should an author debut with an adult novel and then branch into a YA or is the reverse better or does it make a difference? Obviously we're YA first authors, but what do we think about this? Um I, I have to think about what I think we're using. That. It's a same. good question. It is. I wonder. If you're using the same name, I feel like that's something you want to approach very intentionally. But if you're having completely different pen names and like, yeah. you know, aliases, then it's probably whatever one you feel is going to put you into your stride more. I think the interesting thing about YA is it can have adult appeal. And so I think some, and also your YA audience, if you're writing for teens, they are growing up into adults. So um, I, Obviously, I'm not an expert on the topic, but my inclination says YA to adult because then you can not only branch into a new readership, but possibly retain some of your YA readers who've aged out of YA and don't really connect to it as much anymore. Just a thought. Yeah. But that's something I mean, that your agent would be able to weigh in on too. Yeah, I, uh, I'm inclined to say the same, though it's so tough because YA is such a tricky space right now, as we know. Yeah. It the is. market is narrowing. And so I would say like, <clears throat> if this is, it, it's hard because if it's theoretical and you're like picking what to write, then like, I mean, I, you got to go with what your gut says. But like, if you have a book, like don't sit on an adult that you have, that you like, that you right. think you could query and get published, be thinking about long range plans. I actually gave this exact advice yesterday and I've been giving it for a while. Um, this sounds crazy because we are strategic and we think about career and we have some questions about that. But if you hyper focus too much on what you want to do in five years in your career, that will can be a disservice to you because you may never find the person who can enable you to debut now with the book you have now. You you vote you have to think really one book at a time while also thinking five books ahead. But if you, I mean, and just my personal experience when I did my first agent. I was so focused on, I have to have an agent who also does adult for urban fantasy because I wanted to write adult urban fantasy. 
guess who has not written adult urban fantasy and is not planning on it? Because now I write thrillers. I did and not even know this about you. And now I need to Dark okay. Ages. I have like a whole series planned. Oh my I'm gosh, Alexa. I need all this tea when next time we talk. I mean, it was a pretty good idea. Like I'm not like, it's You're something that I never do it. I wanted to basically write my own like feminist, different kind of Dresden files. Not oh. like Dresden files. But I loved that series, but like it's a dude. Do I get a splash like, of paranormal in there? Oh yeah, it was gonna be paranormal. Oh <laughs> my gosh, give it to us. So actually, I say urban fantasy is probably really gonna be more like um paranormal, like ur paranormal romance, urban fantasy. That is okay. Can we talk about how hot romance well, is right now of all kinds? It, this this was like 2008 Alexa, but like I've I mean, had okay. <clears throat> I also, I mean, I have an adult rom com that's been in the back of the file for. 15 years as well the um, is right that's the thing what are you writing right now <laughs> and no, it's true. can you sell it get your foot in the door that is the hardest part it is i like to think of it because i'm definitely a long-term planner yeah i like to think of it though as a linking chain instead of a far goal post so each book is a link in the chain so you want to be intentional mm -hmm. about how you link one book to the next and how you move with your audience Yes. But you don't want to be so concerned about that goalpost in five years. Five years is a long time in an author's career. Most yes. debut authors, five years after they debuted, most of them are not putting books out anymore. Whew. You just you you went to the places I love to go to, but oh no. <laughs> I'm just being transparent. And the reason yes. I say that is because it's important to realize that like each book is its own feat. And it really needs all of your focus and time and energy. That's not to say you're not writing a bunch of books and saving them. Like if you are a prolific writer and you just like to jump around, fill your hard drive with books beyond books. But like, yeah. and, and you know, if you are good at that, consider hybrid. That yeah. Be, if you write that fast, consider it. <laughs> yeah, no, totally. Tri Tripub will never catch up with you if you're that. <laughs> So just don't don't think so far in the future. And I know even to debut writers or authors in the audience who, sorry, my allergies, now my nose is leaking. I have a oh, sneeze yeah. coming. I don't know. I just, the temperature dropped from 86 to 30 today. Oh. And whenever there's a sharp change in temperature, my allergies just go haywire. So anyway, I'm leaking all over the place. But um, one of the things that um, I think is hard for debut authors in particular is there feels, it feels like there's so much pressure. And I'm talking to myself here too. When this book, like last year, this time I was a basket case. Like I couldn't hardly sleep. I had so much goes into this moment. And I just felt like my entire career rested on the success of this book. But both of us, for reasons I can't say yet, can, can say that you are more than one book and you can really pivot in your career. You can really sort of be intentional about how the next book positions you. One of my favorite authors besides Alexa, who's done this, is Tiffany Jackson. She started with Allegedly, and then you saw uh, she went through more books very similar to Allegedly. So like um, Monday's Not Coming is my probably my favorite book from her. But now she's in the, la the latest one she did is White Smoke. And that one is more horror and her horror. next one is more horror. But because her thrillers were so gritty and deep and some of them had tones of like dark, it, it, she, it didn't lose, she, at least from the outside looking in, it does not appear. It lost no. her audience. It only grew her audience. I think her branding thread has been really smart. She's, yeah, yeah it has. And she's, I mean, she's just brilliant. Also, the girl yeah. can write. Like Tiffany, Tiffany writes books in a way where you open them and you're like, yeah, okay. And she's this, beautiful this and kind. It's kind of unfair how... <laughs> She has everything. No, she I, she's she someone I've really looked up to for, for many years. Same, same, same. And the, the, the talent in the prose. Like when I started reading Allegedly, I was like, oh, I don't, I don't belong here. <laughs> <laughs> it's just That's so, so relatable. relatable written. That's so relatable when you're reading a book and you're like, I am an imposter. Oh, what no. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> like Every as a reader, time. you're really happy. And as a writer, you're like, oh, no. I'll never arrive here. Yeah. So, no, that's how it feels sometimes. And just so everyone knows, we feel like that all the time. So right. imposter syndrome is real. Um, but actually, this dovetails perfectly into when it comes to author branding, how much should someone think about it before querying what they intend to be their debut? Um, I love this question. And I'll say, it like, being like, 
nice to most people, I would say, oh, you don't have to think too hard about it. But I know both of us probably thought about this very intentionally because that's the kind of people we are. So you can. You can. I did. My answer is going to be very little. Not oh, because, really? no, but not because you shouldn't. We have to keep it interesting. There has to be contrast here. Like, no, I love that. That's true. Against you. No, I'm kidding. I'm teasing you. <laughs> I, I no, like, like Lex and I both, we're the same person. Okay. So we both did this. But the reason I say very little is because I think sometimes that can be a stumbling block for people who are not marketing or branding minded. And what I really want you to do is to get the book out. Anything yeah. that is an obstacle in you securing an agent and you getting out there and writing. Because there, I feel like there's so many people who want to write a book, but that first one feels like the hardest. And so hard. my encouragement to you before your first book is that you think about it very little. However, that's not to say that once you sign with your agent, you don't start putting some ideas on paper. Before you sell it, thinking point. about positioning later books you want to do. If this, If you asked... Before I submit my third book to my agent, how much should I be thinking about it? I would say a whole 100%. lot. 100%. I mean, you and I have seen the same kind of pitfalls. Like, I always kind of do cringe face emoji when I see an author who were like really good debut, promising debut, and they just make a choice with two or three where I'm like, oh, I don't know how that's going to land in the market or your readership. It, that, and not to scare people, but like you it's about like you mentioned the foundation like the each each like you have to really you do get to a point where then you can do whatever you want sometimes mm -hmm. but like it's very it can feel very tenuous and yeah and generally that is true i i don't don't twist yourself into a pretzel about it on querying because it's true nothing is real until your agent sells your first book yes. until nothing you know what your yes. actual debut is you can't really make any plans true. That's it. Yeah. And that patience is what I actually learned from my agent, who's just such a chill person. Like, get an agent who's more chill than you are. That's my advice. Um, unless you're really chill, then get an agent who is less chill than you, who will like go for things. But I need chill. Um, and even she said, even once we'd sold, she told me to slow down a little to wait until it came out. Cause she was she wasn't wrong. You see how your debut lands. And then you can do a lot of strategy from that um, to what pivoted. are you going to do next? You pivoted very smartly. Yeah. Well, and here's the thing. If I'd been a breakout hit on that book, I would have made different choices. But of course, you know, it's hindsight so funny because I'm like, but then I might have been deprived of the joy of writing murder books. Everything happens for a reason. I and and my debut did like very solidly. Like it didn't, but, but like I, I wasn't, it depends on if you break out on your debut. We've all seen this. The books were like they explode. You're almost locked into writing that forever once that it's happens. What people begin to expect from you. Yeah. It's so like I, I'm fast a little bit. You can break out of it. Yeah. Um, well, some smart. people can break out of it. You have to be very smart. Yeah. And I think um, the right agent and editor and publishing team can help with that. It's just everyone has to be kind of committed to that. Same. Yeah. Everybody has to be aware and committed to addressing yeah. that, I think, head on. Yeah, you have to be on the same page. Um, but also, I mean, it's actually worth talking about like agents and, and authors versus like publishing team and authors, because at least in my personal experience, for me, the rock relationship is the agent, because the agent is the one who's always going to be on your side and on your team, because sometimes your publishing team could have a contrasting goal to you, which sounds weird, but meaning, and that could just be that you're not a lead. And so if you're not a lead, your career and book strategy is just simply going to matter more to you than it's ever going to matter to the team in that situation because they're juggling way more priorities because they, they're they dealing with 20 books and you just have you. So like, um, so, but someone asked about what's it like working with a different agent after you've had one? And we have both uh, had yeah. this experience. Um, well, querying the second time different than the first. It's more stressful in my humble opinion. Um for me, it was. <laughs> it's a different kind of stress. But it's, it's totally different, too. What I actually liked about it is I knew exactly what I wanted. Because, yeah. listen, sharing, having an agent is having an agent is like a relationship. Yeah. And true. imagine it's like dating, but you've never dated before. So you don't know yeah. what you need in your professional partner. You don't know what style of communication you like. I mean, you might know what you like in regular everyday relationships, but this is a, a unique experience. And so I think it's 
very common for authors to get into agent relationships. And then later, as they learn more about what they need and how they work to pivot to a different author relationship. Um, yeah. This happens in in business aside from agenting as well. Like even for me, I, I think we both, we both trained as journalists actually. Yeah. Um, and for me, when I finally got like a taste of what it was actually like to work in mm -hmm. modern entertainment journalism, I was like, oh, this is the worst thing for my anxiety ever invented and I cannot do this. And so that was learning, like, so you can even learn that the thing that you thought you really wanted, like, just, so like, and then I got a job. Yeah. Or I really that I stayed in a job because journalism was a side hustle, but like uh, realizing that, oh, this other thing is just so much better for me on the whole. You're That's just being alive and but especially in your 20s you're gonna be on a journey yeah and, and of course in like, writing at any age exciting <laughs> like yeah. like grab your surfboard don't just be tugged yeah, it's cool. the journey, like surf the journey like yeah. you know like own that time because you can't get it back um yeah but like at least for me like um for, like what i actually liked what was i had a really good relationship with my first agent to be perfectly honest it was really just like fit on the book and sometimes that happens and it's literally not personal. And I actually knew like, I want an agent exactly like this agent, just who really likes this book. <laughs> That's all. That and like, I actually liked that I figured out what I, I really liked because I got what I liked, if that makes sense, which is. Yeah. yeah. I found that my goals in publishing changed. And they will all, change. First of all, because my life changed a little bit. Mm -hmm. I also found that um, I was headed towards burnout. And I, when I sat down to figure out how do I avoid that, the things that I needed weren't just, they just weren't built into my previous agent's process. It's just not the kind of agent that she was. They and changed. so I realized yeah. this just isn't, like I, this just isn't gonna work for me. Several of my friends are still agented by my former agent. Yeah. Um, so I just knew that I needed to make a change. So my mine was it what I did not worry that I wouldn't be able to find an agent. I just wanted to make sure that I didn't make the wrong choice again. And when I say when I say again is I didn't want to change a third time. Like I wanted yeah. to find an agent and like be sure that it was like what I needed. And so I felt this pressure to like not just go with what feels right right now, but go with what, who is an agent that I think is the right fit for me 10 years from now when I'm not writing as much or when I pivot to, you know, when I pivot to a different age category, like who is the right person for my career long term? Because I don't want to switch again. And um, that's what made it difficult. But I, I was, I was without an agent for about three and a half weeks because I wanted to take my time. Like I, I probably, let's see. Yeah, I reached out to the first agent that I wanted to work with. And then I did not sign with someone until I think four weeks later. Like I took a long time to really sit and reach out to different agents and have conversations, long conversations and ask tough questions. Um, Once and you've debuted, you, and that, yeah. that's the thing, like you've seen things and you can yeah. ask those questions. And yeah. yeah, it's that's why I did a whole video on querying once you've already had a book out because it really changes the whole Completely. process. Yeah. I understand too. There are definitely like agents that are like not great agents, but a lot of it is fit. Yeah. So it's Business like I fit. talked to like seven agents, I think the second time around, seven, I think. And all of them were phenomenal, yeah. but it was like, who is the right fit for me? And so that's why it was such a tough decision to make, but I made the best decision in the world and I love my new agent. So your agent's amazing. She is amazing. Oh, sorry. Cat tail. Hi, Katie. <laughs> he just appears and like from the mist. Um, <laughs> he does. Just his tail is what I usually get. Yeah. Well, it's because of the position of the camera. So all you get are, but tails are fun. Tails are super fun. Hold on. Um, oh, I like this question. Do you like your debut novels less than your subsequent books? I think most people uh, go on this journey and you should. Um, your debut will always have a special place in your heart. But I think it's psychological for writers to always love the next thing. 
that's me personally. Yeah, no, absolutely. Your first book would be the, in in theory, your first book is the worst book you ever write. That doesn't it mean it's effectively bad. It just means that your craft continues to grow as as it should. Um, yeah, I I cringe a little bit when I go back and read my first book at a line level because I my my grasp of prose and world building is just so much stronger now, and I see that in my new project, and it's just like, wow. I hope no one asks me to read out loud. <laughs> but again, I love my book. I obviously love it. Um, because to be honest, for Wings of Ebony and Ashes of Gold, it was more than just an execution of a story. It was reaching hearts of YA readers who need to see themselves represented in a book and to see themselves magically powerful in a story like this one. So whenever I'm chastising myself over not being impressed with my lackluster craft, which is, I'm being very hard on myself. I think my book is good. Um, I remind ourselves. I didn't write it for accolades for my prose. I wrote it to reach kids' hearts. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm the I'm the same. Though I I do wonder, and and we'll both. It's kind of delightful. We'll both figure this out. Like I can't wait to like touch base on a couple of years. Um, I'm curious what happened. Like I want to know myself when you have like a catalog. Ugh. How do you fall? Like how? Wh what is your favorite when you got know. like? five or six or seven books. I can't wait to find out. I hope. I'm going to ask um, some, like, leaders. Right? Ask some people who are more established, because, like, like, do you have, like, little, like, it's, like, your favorite child? And, like, <laughs> I don't know. Do you ever reach a point where you're happy with your past books? Probably not. I want to know. Because <laughs> every book is a challenge, right? Like, yeah. so, so, I mean, unless you choose to write something that's very comfortable, but I feel like the nature of keeping the writing interesting is us thinking of ways to challenge ourselves. So, when I thought about my next YA project that I'm, you know, fine tuning right now, I specifically thought of the idea and I was like, I can see what this book can be in my head. And it scares the daylights out of me because it's very intimidating. Yeah. I was like, and I'm going to kind of good. Yeah. So I'm very nervous. I'm very nervous about that, but in a, in a great way. So we'll see. My thrillers scare me a little. Like um, Pretty Dead Queens was a challenge. Yeah. I'm really mm -hmm. working through that book pretty hard. I'm going to jump to adult and it's going to be hard. And I'm like, that sounds really kind of fun. I feel I'm like really, adult is its own animal. I'm very curious it is. entrenched into how it, because I feel like adult finds its readers differently than YA. Yeah. So oh, I, that's a whole nother conversation we have to have. I'm so in, in, like yeah. involved. Although I will be in my next series for the next five years, yeah. um, at least. So I'm very excited yeah. about that. Um, no, it's, it's, I'm doing multi POV too. I can oh, always, you didn't know that about the new one? I no. heard about PPOV. It's a lot. Oh, my goodness. Okay, so my new series that I can't talk about is is mostly one POV, but I have an alternate POV. And the alternate POV, I think he's the one that has, like, the adult, like, oh. reader appeal. Nice. Um, he's very gray. Kind of like, like Tyrion gray. Yeah. Nice. Oh, I love characters like that. I love characters, period. Like world magic, yes. Plot, yes. But characters, oh, it's everything. Exactly. So how do you balance editing a book while writing a new one? I think you've done this. I don't think I've done this. Really? Um, I am so slow. So you've got like different contracts. Yes. I am very one at a time. I, have um, I haven't figured out how to balance it yet. As of today, I have nine contracted books. The second of those comes out on the 11th of January. Um, and four of those have not been announced yet. Um, I like to compartmentalize my time. So I literally plan out my calendar every year um, where I decide what project I'm working on for what month. So March will be, and I mean specifically writing or revising. So March, so February will be this project. Um, March will be this project. And I literally just make that entire month about that project. And what's hard about that is when my deadlines start to push up against each other. But I, I tend to be very protective of that creative space because if I'm going to function and get these books out and do them correctly, I need to be able to have that set aside time. 90% of the time I beat my goal. Like if I need, if I say I need a whole month, I usually will only need like two and a half, three weeks, but I like to have buffer time. So I do, I, I partition my year. I can tell you right now that in February, I am doing nothing but world building, the second book in my new series. I can tell you that in uh, March, I'm writing my second middle grade. So like I section off my my month like that. 
Well, this is this dovetails perfectly into the idea of talking about writer setting writer goals. Just a nice little New Year's topic. So, like, did you like sit down last week and like make all of those plans? Do you plan the whole year ahead or I quarterly? I plan the year, and and this is all flexible. And I don't plan it methodically I, until I get a little closer. It's just assigning each month, and it's always when I outline these plans, they're always like super flexible. It's very much like in an ideal world, this is how it could go. And so I outline based on what I know about my contracts, based on the deadlines that I know I have coming. I assign each month, and then promo. I assign each month a book, and then I also pick two months that I assign off. Okay. I have yet to actually honor that. I'm lucky if I get maybe two weeks, but I do at least aim for that. Like this year, I think my off months are, or 2022, my off months are November and June. I'm sorry, December and June, but we'll see. I'm hoping that I don't have any more January books coming out. I'm thinking Ashes will be the last one because it's just a lot to juggle over the holidays, yes. promoting a book that comes out in January. So anyway, um, yeah, that's what I do. I, and I just, again, I'm just deciding a month. When I get closer, I go in, I'm looking for my calendar here. I go in at a month view and I like itemize what my month looks like. <clears throat> and I also do this kind of like yearly view because I like to see, can you see the circles? Yeah. Right? Those are my busy times. And I like to pull back from a year's perspective and see, are there too many circles and lines? Like, I know that seems really basic, but I need to make sure, I mean, I have, I have three children, I have a whole partner, you know, like I have a whole life and I need to make sure my life is not just books because I need to be present as well. And so sometimes when I'm scheduling things like, oh, am I, and I just look at that day, like, oh, I'm free, sure, I'll do it. But then I didn't realize I have six other things happening that week. So this helps me look at the year as a whole and go, okay, which months have too much happening? And then like- that you know, specifically say, okay, no more circles and lines in this year. That's what I call them, circles and lines. And then when I get closer, I do a week by week thing. Um, and one of the biggest things I would recommend if you have the ability, if you feel overworked by the publishing promotion schedule, is do not agree to do something when you only have looked at your day calendar. Because like I was saying, I've really screwed myself over thinking, um, oh, I have nothing happening on that Wednesday. Right. But I have three things happening Tuesday, four things happening Thursday. Wednesday was supposed to be my off day, but because I just zoomed in, I didn't notice that. And so um, I was very, very exhausted going into promoting Ashes. Like I couldn't sleep because I was so overly exhausted for two weeks. I was only getting like two to three hours a night leading up to release. So going into Ashes, whole different vibe, whole different vibe. Very, very intentional about my time. Um, and that's helping a lot. Um, I mean, you're like a powerhouse. Like you go so hard at marketing and branding and you're really good at it, but also like, dang, that's a lot. Um, but actually again, another thing that I want to talk about, well, I will do more of the viewer questions, but selfishly, I want to hear more about, um, how you approached working with a street team. I think that's such a fascinating author marketing topic that's um like it's not new like people have been doing it but like i really took notice of how you did it um you were really on my i mean not just I mean, it's because we're friends but like i was really impressed Thank you. I, do you think, I do think we grew as friends like through wings of ebony like yeah. over the past couple of years but yeah. when i started my street team first of all before i even started a street team or committed to one in my head I started to take note of Hofsa's street team. And I started to wonder, is this something I want to do? Because I'd never seen one before. I didn't think they were like this big thing. Or they were very They're like, not. Session quiet. so I actually researched street teams and watched <laughs> how others did them for about eight months before I committed to saying I'm going to do it. And when I say watched, I mean, anytime I would see something very successful that seemed street team driven, like a post that went viral or a bunch of enthusiastic readers, you know, hyping something, I would screenshot it and I would save it. And I would, I sifted through these things and I was like, okay, this was smart. This was smart. This is so smart. And I used all of that like insight to craft a street team. I wanted something that felt like a community first and foremost, because I think the most successful street teams are, are not transactional. 
Um, I was, I did not want to create a space where I'm just asking people to do things for me all the time. While I am appreciative, I know readers would be happy to retweet stuff for me. I just don't, that one, that just doesn't feel right. <laughs> and two, I'm interested in connecting with these people who are volunteering of themselves for me. So I specifically wanted to create a community, like an insular community of people who love books, who love writing, um, who are just passionate readers, bloggers, who people who are kind of in or adjacent to the book world. And I wanted to create a space for us to communicate and connect and also hype my book. And so I created a Slack and I created all these activities and icebreakers to do. We have like when we usually when we start the Slack at the beginning of like the promo season, when I open it up, we start with like a, a debate about like something that I people are on opposite ends. In this book, it's there's a love triangle. So it's like a ship war debate between the two love interests. And so that's always fun. And like what we'll do, I'll set it up and make it a big thing. Like there will be prizes and like giveaways and there will be like memes like if you can create your own memes and it's just like this entire like place full of laughter and like uh, there's a space to talk about what we're currently reading there's a space to talk about other books we love um when 2020 was on fire we got to go to that slack and like really love on each other and like spread positivity and encouragement to one another to create this galvanizing environment that people want to be a part of and I think the most successful promotion is word of mouth. And I think the most successful word of mouth is heartfelt. And I think that happens when you connect with these people who are willing to give of their time. So yes, you can just have some people in a DM and say, retweet this. And they might, but I don't think that's the most effective way. I think personable um, goes a lot further. And that's very much in line with like my personality. And especially in like a pandemic world, I was eager to connect with people because we couldn't go anywhere. And so I'm an extrovert. So it's was like, yes, let's do this. So I, I channeled a lot of like my personality, um, being an extrovert, my desire to connect with people, other people's desire to connect and books more centrally. Like my street team is about ashes. I think the sneeze is... You're good. <laughs> Finally, I've had that sneeze for like an hour. <laughs> um, but I think that my street team is not just about Ashes of Gold and Wings of Ebony. It's about our mutual love of books. Um, and I think that's what makes it a really fun place. Logistically, um, with Wings, because I was super busy, because there's a lot that goes into a debut. There was just a lot of push and stuff to do. I was doing about nine to 12 things a week, be it interviews, guest posts, blog posts, videos, something. Um, and it was quite exhausting. So I actually hired an assistant last year and my assistant helped me manage my Slack. Um, she would go in and help log points for things. We have like um, tacos, gyms, and crowns that people earn for doing tasks. So if they retweet something, they can get like 10 tacos and then you can trade in your tacos for goodies and things like that. So um, there's all kinds of things like that and all of it's built into the snap Slack. So I wanted it to feel organized and I wanted it to kind of run like a machine. So I post a task the the reward is like whatever the task is worth is there um and not everything has rewards sometimes it's just like hey would you mind boosting this and then some people will um but anyway so i post the task and then um people can accept the task and then this the app in slack keeps track of everybody's points and then all i have to do is we have like a shopping zoom and they we all hop on zoom so they get time with the author we talk we connect and then they get to trade in their points for stuff and i start mailing out stuff to everybody. So again, I make it very relationship oriented, which is a lot. It's a lot. I'm overwhelmed. Like not in a bad way, a little, um, what's the app in, what's the app in Slack that tallies? Raidboss. R-A-I-D-B-O-S-S. -S. I need all of this like written down and okay. I mean, which I can get from you. Um, well, so how did you, um, set up the, like, auditions for the street team like the form and how did how uh, how many people did you have um uh you said i did an application on google form and i always get hundreds of applications way more than i can ever <laughs> i'm actually going to take an allegro because it's not getting better <laughs> um i actually get way more applications than i can actually <laughs> do so I don't know that I have a perfect system for how to, thank you, sweetie. Yes, you can have that. Go ahead. I don't know that I have a perfect system for how to pick them out. 
Um, my assistant helped <laughs> a lot last time. Sorry, I'm being attacked by allergies. Take care of yourself. So bad. Okay, that'll be working in about 20 minutes. Um, but no, I don't have a perfect system. I comb through everything very strategically and I try to read everything thoroughly, understand why people want to be on the street team. Some people just apply to apply. Like okay. they're not actually interested in doing anything. They just want to apply yeah. because they think they'll get a free book. Well, that's why I want to ask you all these questions because like I have all sorts of question marks and fears because it is a lot of work from the author. The author has to do, there's a lot of bandwidth that you have to put in. And of yes. course, the, the point is the ROI can be really, really great. But my concern yeah. is exactly that. Is it just people who want a free book? Because um, because it, it's pretty standard, as I understand it, for straight teams, they all get a, an arc. No, that's not how my street team works. Oh, okay. Oh, see, so exactly. Because that's that my concern. But you know that the publisher has people on their radar, influencers that they're specifically reaching out to. And I think it depends on the purpose of the street team and yeah. like the expectations you set in the application. Specifically, I'm looking for a community who loves books, wants a place to talk about books, wants to connect with the author of a book that they might have liked and wants yeah. to help me promote my next book. So okay. I wish it as a place for community. I would love everybody in my street team to get an arc, but because my street team is so huge, like there are over a hundred people in my street team usually, um, it's just not realistic. I okay. do try to connect with my publisher and let them know, hey, if such and such says they're on my street team, you can run their name by me and I'll let you know for sure. Cause I do have some influencers in my group and I, I have had several people in my street team actually get an arc but it isn't something like i'm not able to give an arc to everyone i don't have the freedom to do that because they're very oh, I, li I like this info they're very People particular tell. i'm i'm considering no, doing the a, lot, a lot depends on the publisher right sometimes yeah. publishers are not hands-on sometimes they're just like give your book to whoever you want but my publisher has been with both my books especially the first one very intentional about who they give free copies to yeah. And really want Mine's to similar. Yeah. Yes. And so because okay. of that, like I'm not the gatekeeper for it. And I make okay. that very clear from the application. I can't give you a free copy of my book. That said, if you earn like 500 tacos, I will happily send you a signed one, you know, so I yeah. can do something like that. And I made that number up. I actually don't, I don't even know if I have, I think I have a signed arc as one of the rewards, but even that, I didn't even know my publisher was going to give me signed arcs for a long time because the world is so upside down. <laughs> So yeah, I have no idea if I'm getting arcs, like none it's of that. It's just so hard nowadays yeah. with paper arcs. They just really aren't printing a lot. So I have like six and I was like, wait, limited supply. <laughs> um, one of the things, <laughs> one of the things to make sure you do if you are running a street team is try to do a lot of digital or flat swag yeah. <laughs> because I paid that's my other concern. I'm very bad at logistics. Like I'm just physically, like it's, it's my brain. Um, I spent probably ADHD TikTok has been speaking to me recently, which has prompted a lot of questions, but like my ability to actually go to the post office to do things I'm supposed to do as an adult, very bad. I have something I have to do. I um, and so I don't want, I'm worried about like my concern personally, like hmm. y'all are like, I'm like, Jay, tell me all the secrets. But like, I feel like, other people would have these concerns too, because the whole marketing onus put on authors is so overwhelming to even think about. My concern is I don't want to set something up that I can't follow through on. And then I'm the failure and I let down the, the street team, the readers, et cetera. Um, yeah, I, I, but I love what you did with it. Well, it was a lot. I mean, with wings of ebony from the wings of ebony street team to the ashes, I changed a lot of things. I have a lot of flat swag. I probably spent literally, um, fifteen hundred dollars in shipping. Last last time, just in shipping, postage, because I was mailing books. I mailed one book to England. It was the sh I don't even want to talk about how expensive that was, but I didn't think about that because at the time, I just planned to order them through Book Depository, but they didn't have my signed copies um, because remember I signed my entire first printing on on, yeah. Ash, on wings. So I thought the ones from Book Depository will automatically be signed. That wasn't necessarily the case. So I ended up having to sign it and ship it myself, um, which was very expensive. But I did it because for the reason you said, I did not want to disappoint my readers. So I just set yeah. aside a part of my marketing budget for extra postage. And then for Ashes, I, I'm using book plates, which are flat, 
which is very helpful so to minimize my postage so I can ship things in envelopes um, and just doing more digital kind of stuff. <laughs> Bless you. Gesundheit will just, will we'll be German. <laughs> I get what's called sneeze attacks. I sneeze like 50 times. <laughs> and once they start, they don't stop. So this is going to be me for a minute. That should be in a book. <laughs> I think it's, I don't know if it's dust or, or alley. I don't know, but it's bad. Um, I should have taken an Allegra this morning if I were thinking, because I knew the temperature dropped, but you know. Uh, there are more questions. I just kind of got lost in the weeds of the chat. Hold on. There are a lot of really good questions. Uh, let me go back up. Oh, here's a, just a fun one for you. Was Gazan based on a real island? It was not. It was not. Gazan wasn't. Um, it was just an island off the coast of Africa. Um, I... There are definitely pieces of the island. Like I made up the trees and the landscape on the island. And ooh, in Ashes of Gold, you get to a lot of people when they were reading Wings, they were like, I wanna, I wanna go back to Gazan. I want more from Magic Island. Thank you, sweetie. Go ahead. Okay, no, go. <laughs> she has to be on camera. She, she wants her real estate. Um, in this book, it's 95% on the magical island. So you get a lot more magic, a lot more fantasy, you get a lot more depth to everything since we have dealt with the threat in East Row. Um, but no, it was not directly inspired by any existing island because I wanted to stay away from the colonization history of those islands and create my own um, because I, I just feel like you have to be very careful if you are going to model it after something that you do it with intention. Yeah. And I knew the story I wanted to tell already, so I decided to just create one of my own. Hmm. Well, here's a fun one. Um, have we ever thought of co-writing a book with each other or generally? <laughs> Bless you. You go um, first. Uh, generally, yes. Except I, I'm just so wary of it where, like, I don't know if I could. You have to, like, really be mesh well with another writer to co-write. Uh, you have to know that, like, your process works well together, your speed um, your vibes, your style. I'm like a soft maybe, but like, at least for me, I don't think it's something I would do so long as I am not writing full time. I feel like if I were writing full time, it might be something I could juggle. How do you feel? Well, I, I agree. And I am, um, I am ghost writing. I put this in air quotes because I, I will be able to have my name on the front, but I am ghost writing a nonfiction project for a friend of mine who, I told her, I was like, your life is too inspiring. You need to write a book. She was like, what? I was like, no, no, no. I'll write it. You, It's your book, though. And so we approached publishing, and they were very excited about that. Okay. Oh, no, thank you. Uh, <laughs> my little helper. Um, but because her and I know each other super well, that's why we can do it. Yeah. We've known each other since we were 14. She's, she's, she was a year younger than me, so 13. I was 14. Um we're sorority sisters. I mean, sorority in high school. We had high school sororities in my city. Um, and so we're very, very close. And so the content of the book and like the parts of her life that I'm writing, I actually witnessed a lot of this stuff as her friend. And I think that's what how I would be able to execute it. Yeah. Co-writing a nonfiction book for someone I don't know honestly feels impossible. Hmm. Impossible. A fiction book... <laughs> I have tried with a friend of mine to do a couple scenes. And I think the challenge is, is like you're saying you have to have very similar processes because if you're a pants or a plotter or an outline, like you really have to be one brain. Yeah. So I think that it can be done. I just, there's one person who I know well enough that I could write. We could write together because we are like the same brain in terms of editorially, we have the same brain, okay. but even then, the types of, you know, because writing is such a, like, you have to write from passion, right? You want to write a story you want to tell. And so sometimes somebody you could write with, they may not be passionate about the same topic. They might want to highlight a different theme than you want to highlight. So I don't know. So people who do it, I am in awe of. Of course, yeah. I'd love to write a thriller with you because you're amazing. Um, I don't know if you'd like my process. I think we have very different processes. <laughs> we have very different processes. You'd, you'd be like... <laughs> I'm, I'm literally currently on like a two month, like refilling the well drafting break. And I feel like you're so fast. That's so good of you. That's so good, Alexa. 
I mean, it's mostly that I wrote 10,000 words and then just was like, no, I'm good for now. That's fine. <laughs> you deserve that. You deserve that break. I need that time. No, but I have, I've legitimately figured out a lot about the book, which is important for me. You know, you know, I just have to figure out what the book is and then I can write it. So Distance. But you see, the way I do that is I write it first because so much is fantasy and I need to see how it functions on the page. Like a year ago, I wrote 83,000 words during Nano of this first book in my next series. And then I got to the end and I deleted all of them. Oh, I I was like, this is not, this is a great exploration, but this, and I know what I want to do now, but this is not it. I deleted wow. every story and started over. And I mean, I've written, and that's, if I count the 83,000, the current 142,000, and like all the stuff I've deleted and the backstory scenes I've written, I've probably written 300,000 words just wow. to get this book out. See, people who are smarter than me, they just pause and think. And I'm like, no, 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 let me just keep writing. Let me just keep writing. <laughs> but everyone has a different process. And that's what I like. Yeah. I like that. Like, we figure we figure it out. Um, kind of a process, just quickie. Uh, how much uh, do you collaborate with your agents on what future projects to work on? This is going to be different for every author. Um, and I feel like you and I are very self-assured uh, writers who know what we want to work on. Um, cause I will say I, and, and luckily I have an agent who fits me professionally in this way. This is again about fit. I have known people who don't, who really want an agent to tell them what to work on. I don't want that. Really? Yeah. I have friends who want that. And I'm like, that's amazing to me. I, just, I feel stifled and I wouldn't want hey, to be in that relationship, hey. but I have friends who want the opposite, but I like that my agent and every agent's different. Sign, like it's just it's her vibe like she it's like I like this person's writing generally I like how they write yes. she can roll with almost anything her clients write and she's also fine with how stubborn I am and so like I personally go to my agent especially in fairness it's also because I've sold some books now it would be different yeah. if like yeah. we'd subbed a couple and none of them had sold we'd probably be a lot more like she I would need you. She trusts you. Yeah, well, that you helps. And I trust her, yeah. which helps. But I honestly just go, guess what? I'm writing this. Hey. And I I honestly don't do a lot of collaboration there. Uh, I will run things by her. And obviously, she looks at my proposals. But she's also figured out by now that I'm like, once I like, I'm like a freight train. Like, once I'm like on on like especially my thrillers, like, it's because I start from the end now. Like, I know where I'm going. Oh, yeah. She can give suggestions the same way my editor can give suggestions. And like, I can like, but it still has a fit within the framework of what I have decided I'm going to write. That's me personally. And she's, she goes with it and we work very well together, but I know authors who are the opposite. So <laughs> my agent is um, one of the most brilliant people I've ever met. She has such strong story instinct like she blows me away every day I'm in shock that like I get to work with her <clears throat> and um I haven't gotten to okay so when I I'm trying to think of what I can say publicly okay so when I signed with her when I was switching agents I did know what my next project what I well I had a few different book ideas but I had one that I was really wanting to do the one that I had already written 83,000 up and I was still consciously like working on. So I knew what I wanted to work on. But when I was querying that second time, I pitched it as here, like three bullet point ideas or four bullet point ideas. However, bullet point one is already in progress. And so each of them, every single one of the agents is like that first one, that's the one, that's the one yeah. that was like on the call before I signed with anybody. So I actually knew going in, what the what my agent wanted me to work on and it was what I was most passionate about um next and it's a series which means we don't have that conversation for a while because now I'm going to be in the series for a bit but I anticipate talking to her about my next ideas because she does just have really good commercial instinct that said I'm not going to put ideas in front of her that I'm not passionate about writing yeah you have um, to be willing to write them Yes. Um, and I'm going to be very choosy about what books I put in front of her. Like I have ideas about what I want to do after the series because I want this world to be very large. Um, but that's a conversation I'm going to have with her. And she just has so much experience creating these very long 
um, healthy author careers that I'm very curious to pick her brain on what she would say should go next. But with this next series, it just so happened that when I signed, we were all on the same page that that's what I needed to be doing. Um, This is a related question. Um, Will your agent be bothered if you change genre? Our agents won't, but some agents are. So like there's no a one size fits all answer to this question. I'm sure I, I certainly do. I'm sure you also know, we all know someone whose agent balked when they wanted to switch genres. It, it, but like, it's not the end of the world. You then find an agent who's into whatever your switch is. And that said, if I wanted to write horror, my agent would dip out on that. Like, and I know that, but I don't write horror. So it works out. Like I write dark, but I don't, I don't, the hallmarks of that genre luckily are not what I'm doing, but my agent is a scary cat. And I know that. So like, if I, if I went real dark, we'd have a, a respectful professional conversation and we'd figure something out. Um, but that, and that's just my particular agent. I still can't believe she has rolled with me writing thrillers. It edges, it, it like creeps right up to the edge of what scares her. My God. Uh, but it's because they're so commercial. So yeah. like well, I said, I, is jam. she's so good at commercial. commercials are jam. Exactly. And, and, but every agent's different. Some yeah. agents are like, they only want to work on grounded, realistic fiction. And indeed, if you hit them with like SFF, they might go like, I don't know what to do with this. It, it is different. different. And selling it is different and strategy for it yeah. is different and how you position it, I think. is They might not have the connections and that's legit. You want them to feel confident in knowing who they can pitch this to, but also it, 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 it impacts you editorially. Um, it's scary if they're bothered that you want to change genre, but I have seen and kind of had like vague experiences myself in the past with there's nothing worse than realizing your agent doesn't understand, read, or like the genre you're writing. And so thus editorially, they cannot help you. And that's also like, I think that's like, there's a domino effect there because then you have to question, can they sell it if they don't understand it? And so it's a, it's scary, but it can sometimes weirdly be in your best interest if, if, if you're making a big shift and you need to move on. Um, I think I know what you're going to say. Would you recommend mentorship for clearing? Why or why not? Me? Yes, I definitely, um, I wait being, wait, would you recommend a mentorship before? Oh, if you can get one, I think they're amazing. Um, I think they are as amazing as their mentor, but I think even at a bare minimum, they're going to give you eyes on your manuscript that are going to give you like a different level of feedback than you may have had before. And that is just priceless. Like to have an experienced writer look over your work and give you a read on it is so beneficial. A lot of times querying writers haven't had their work read by anybody but like a few friends, which is fine. I'm not discouraging that. But you really want someone who understands how to look at story structure and voice and pacing and these things that agents are going to be looking for in your work. Um, So I think it would be phenomenal. Now, do you have to? No. But should you try if you can? Yeah. It's, um, I mean, it's the whole reason that, you know, AMM exists um, and that I like them in general. I did them myself as a writer. It's basically like you can have great, like really great CPs and we hope you do, but there's something about someone who's made that next step, maybe even two steps ahead if they've got a book out um, who can hopefully give you perspective on the market, basically. Like it's that it's like, how can they help you get that edge to take the next steps? It's the professional side. That's the stuff that I really like um as fun as editorial is i'm all about like how do we market this in queries i'm I'm on the query writing stage with my mentee i'm really excited i'm very excited to find like when i look i'm typically looking at hook um and writing i think most of the time voice writing um here's fun craft one um talk about pacing and how you each go about it oh that's what's well, hard um i'm i you say i'm good at it but like it's just it's something i've struggled with so much in the past that it's hard to have confidence um 
so I'll say like on your early books, some of it's just um, making mistakes and learning from them and learning how to fix pacing and editing so that you can figure out how to draft it better later. Give yourself that grace is what I'll say. That's what I did. I had pacing problems on all of my early books. Um, and I've made videos about it. So you can just go watch the video. And I, I did a standalone for it. And then I, I did one in the last year that was the top three tips that like changed my writing for the better. Because one is the one that my agent gave me an, an editing tip for pacing. And it really was a game changer for me. Um, it only helps with one kind of pacing problem. But that was her line edit tip. Literally just if you feel like you cannot sacrifice any of the literal things that happen, but there's a pacing problem, you just have to be really strict with yourself. You go through and you are brutal with yourself on a line level. You trim wordiness and long paragraphs and like you you suck it in that can be one but that's only one pacing fix but it's one that really helped me figure out how to tighten basically um and then like for thriller specifically cliffhangers man micro cliffhangers it and then it's not gonna work in every genre but it's magic man you 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 leave them with some kind of question at the end of every chapter not a cheap question though sometimes i do a cheap question sometimes i'm terrible and it's like someone screams and then the next page it's like you disarm it that's a cheap tactic you can get away with sometimes but it's just you have to leave them wondering something even if it's as basic as oh god what's going to happen you need to leave them with something or oh how how are they going to react to that or how could this possibly get worse it's a question um and then just conflict and starting conflict into your story and like getting good at throwing those things at the book what about you i agree with all that um i use a lot of micro cliffhangers in my writing as well um and very intentionally it's very much stylistically something i love as a reader and something i do as a writer i think um when I think of pacing, I think about it a little bit more methodically from an editorial perspective. Um, my books are all paced poorly at first and it too, but um, to start, I think, I think there's the first thing to realize is that there are different reasons why you write things. So mm -hmm. when you write a scene that's too long winded and there's a bunch of fluff in there that you don't really need and it's slowing things down, that doesn't mean you didn't need to write it. You might've needed to know what happened but that doesn't mean it needs to go in the story. And so a lot less, sometimes people are over writers, sometimes people are exploratory writers where you needed to write that scene being super long-winded and you know that her grandmother came in and her grandmother said that thing, even though that's not relevant to the plot um, and you might cut it later, but you needed that in the back of your mind to color the world in a way that kind of, you know, makes the world building feel authentic. And so I think a lot of times when we look at pacing, we're attacking it sometimes not realizing that what you're really looking for is you're trying to, dis to to discern between what needs to be in the story and what do I need to know? Like, what does the reader need to know and what do I need to know? And I think when you approach a scene that you're writing from the perspective, I'm going to write everything. I'm going to write what I need to know and I'm going to write what the reader needs to know. And you let yourself, because this is a process for some, you let yourself execute that if you're an overwriter. My, my main critique partner is an overwriter, notorious overwriter. And this is her style because she has to know what happens in those in-between moments in order for the moments that she does give to read with authenticity. So you go into your scene, you write what you need to write, and then you judiciously go back and say, what does the reader need to know? And you cut everything else. And if it hurts too much, copy paste or cut it and paste it somewhere so it doesn't feel so bad eventually you'll just start deleting it um but i do think that that really helps is like understanding you know what you're looking for when you're chopping pacing and then another thing is when i look at the when i look at the plot of the story i'm a big believer in jessica birdie's um save a cat save yeah well and so the next question is gonna dovetail literally perfectly Fun and game yeah. feet, murky middle. So save it's the cat. To that. That's that's related to pacing hugely because that's the the curse of the middle is pacing, right? But I am a big believer in Jessica Brody. Je Jessica Brody's save the cat. Why can't I remember? Is it save a cat? Save the cat. Save the cat writes a novel. Writes a novel. Okay, there we go. I big believer in it. I use it religiously. And the the main thing to remember with beats when you're using story beats 
which is what this novel is about. Um, is that, pl in my opinion, I'm not an expert. Obviously, I'm not Jessica Brody. I'm Jessica L. <laughs> Different Jessica. Um, but in my opinion, <laughs> my very non-expert opinion, plot exists to serve character, not the other way around. So if you have a fundamental understanding of how does my character need to grow? What do they need to unlearn? How do they need to change? How am I going to challenge this character in this book? The scenes that you put them into your book should specifically be scenes that are going to incrementally confront your your character's view of the world. So if you have a scene in there that's incredibly entertaining, but doesn't deal with your character's um, misbelief of the world or doesn't challenge them or grow them, or at least confront their misunderstanding of the things that they see around them, you have to ask yourself, do I need this here? And if I do need this here, why? What is it doing to further the story? Because when a plot drags, or sorry, when pacing drags in general, not all the time, but in general, it feels like the story is kind of paused. And the reader is kind of like, okay, but can we get back to blank? It's that blank that you need to be cognizant of all the time. It's, it's usually because of character. Like I've given this advice before as well, that uh, what can lead to bloated middles is like, let's say it's romance. If you hit on the beat over and over again of, oh, they keep squabbling. There's no growth or change happening. Exactly. You get a couple and then you have to move on or in a yeah. mystery. It can't be endless and we'll go here and we'll go here. And it's this weird alchemy. So to the murky middle and this whole thing, everything you said, I do that. I cut so much, not so much, but like it's the editing. Because yes. sometimes, especially with thrillers, I have to write the most like basic. My first drafts are always like, linear in the sense that I know what happened and who did it and I'll I have to write it in a way that could be too obvious the first time and fix it in editing and pacing comes into that as well because exactly I might have so about fun and games so I want to put this up here because I just want to tell you that I have been there and don't stress out too much I sometimes when I'm writing the middle this happened on Pretty Dead Queens real bad literally wasn't 100% sure what my midpoint was. I mean, I knew what it was and I was writing plot to it. Point or your character midpoint? Or like... Plot midpoint. Okay, okay. But that's the thing. In the course of editing, when you're tightening pacing and refining fun and games and making that murky less murky, um, sometimes your beats will move around and change. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yeah. What I thought was the midpoint, I basically came up with a better thing that I... I'm actually not 100% convinced I know what the midpoint of the book is. Um, don't look at me. It's fine. But, be <laughs> but because I refined and deepened and tightened and made my pacing better. So it you can complicate it, but also tighten it on editing. Don't stress yourself out. So for fun and games, what I like to say is, what is first of all, I like to ask, what is your book about? That And I, the short version. Like, what are you going to say? What are you going to spit out in a tweet or the, an elevator pitch that's going to make me want to read your book? That is your premise. That's your book premise. And when I think of fun and games, and I'm pretty sure this is borrowed language, so I'm not taking credit for this wisdom, I call it the promise of the premise. So in the fun and games beat, it doesn't necessarily need to be fun and games. It actually can be incredibly destitute and terrible and, and scary or whatever you're going for. It's the idea that the reason the reader picked up that book, whatever premise you promised them, like the Hunger Games, for example, that's what you're delivering in that beat. And so in that section of the book, at constantly asking yourself, what did I promise readers in the premise this book was going to be about? That's the meat of what's happening in that fun and games beat. And then I think exactly what Alexa is saying, I see so much, is like, you don't need to hit the beat five times. You need to hit the beat and keep going. Um, but be gracious with yourself because you might need to overwrite the beat because yes. you know what? Sometimes I see your favorite of the five. Exactly. I was going to yeah. say, I see that, I've done that. often yeah. where like you write you in, I think our subconscious is aware. Like you're like, especially in romance, you're like, I'm not super satisfied with this bickering, but it's kind of cute. I don't want to delete it. And then they fight again yeah. and then they fight again. And you're like, Oh, I really like that argument. Just cut yeah. the other two. You I've know? done that in every book. I will yes. overwrite and then refine and then pick. Yeah, uh, romantic interactions and weirdly in the thriller genre, cop interactions. Yeah, I end up redoing yeah. them over and over because it's yeah, exactly. It's like getting striking that balance just perfectly. Yeah. 
but it's kind of fun to write it a bunch yeah. of different ways. Explore, like remember what, like you write certain things for certain reasons and it's not always because it belongs in the book, but that doesn't mean you didn't need to write it to know it. Yeah. I just want to say briefly, I just want to like blow some minds um, about like urban fantasy detective, you know, the detectives aren't my fave trope. Um, yeah, except for urban fantasy. I like that trope in urban fantasy, just not in regular mystery. So my urban fantasy I was working on had detectives. Just blowing my mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, it's just so funny. Like, the different things that we like. Uh, I'll tell you about it later, Jay. It, it was uh, Jerry, I will be happy to do this. I also am going to send you my first chapter rewrite of my next project because I you're a master of pacing. And I just wrote it. And I have to turn it into my editor in, like, a week and a half. So. Okay. I want your eyes. Uh oh. Uh, I'll just say briefly. If it's YA sci-fi, yes. I can say less about adult sci-fi. It has a healthier market, but it's still like, um, sci-fi is just always gonna be less popular than fantasy, period. Fantasy is just a more mainstream uh, speculative yeah. genre. We've just found, found that over and over again. But in YA, yes, doesn't mean don't do it, but um, you have to be, just go with your eyes open and be very pragmatic. Um, be really sharp on your comp titles. Yes. And don't, it's still, we're still in a, in a market where YA people don't want to see the word dystopian. So if you've written one, just hide it. Basically. Yeah. Um, let's see. More questions. This is an interesting question. Uh, do authors need to watch out for certain themes slash tropes, meaning they're using the same ones for each genre? Um, mm -hmm. Do you consider that when, I mean, that's an interesting question because like, it's definitely a question that comes up in thriller. What mm -hmm. about for you in, in YA fantasy? I feel like I'm at an interesting intersection because I'm writing in an age category and genre that for a very long time didn't have a lot of marginalization. And so I feel like we're still diversifying shelves in that area. And so it's it's always this like push pull internally of like, okay, yes, chosen one and love triangles have been done, but question mark, when have the love triangles been done with two black love interests and one is like from the hood? Or yeah. when is the chosen one trope been done and it's a brown girl in the center? Or like, when has it been done when it's been inverted in this way that I'm inverting it? Um, and so it's always this push-pull relationship of like me wanting to write what I want to write because I haven't seen it done that way in, yeah. in a story where I saw myself. Um, but the market can be very finicky. And by the market, I mean publishing um, in terms of like what they're willing to put their money behind. So it's always a, a push-pull. The biggest thing I will say is I'm not going to tell myself that a trope is off limits. What I will tell myself is I need to do it so differently and so well, no one has a word to say about it. Yeah. So um, I would say that's my approach. Like I did love triangles and I know how people feel about them, but I'm very, very proud you, of them. You know that okay. I also, you know that I love the love triangles. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yeah, I agree. Well, I, and, and exactly. I think it's two pronged. So generally, absolutely. It's amazing how a new perspective can make a trope fresh. There are also themes that are universal and endemic to certain genres and categories, and it's totally okay for multiple books to hit on the same themes. YA generally, like there are themes that repeat. Yeah. Same thing in sci-fi. That's totally okay because a theme is a theme. It's how you approach a theme. Um, and then, like for me, actually, love triangles I think is a good example. Um, there are. I'd say there are so there are very few tropes, tropes, not genres that I would consider dead in most for the most part but also just consider timing and approach so for example i'm writing an isolation trope ya uh thriller um and even an adult thriller you, as popular as they are they haven't been done that often and in ya they really just haven't been done much at all so there is a fresh ripe space but there are other tropes in for for thrillers that are approaching more of a saturation point. And so there's always just a balance of like, what's good about thrillers, at least specifically, is thriller readers love repeat tropes. If they love a trope, they'll read five books with that trope. The question is, will they read 15 books with that trope? And in a certain like 
limited period of time in publishing? Sometimes the answer is no. So some of that's just timing. So if you're choosing between projects. So for example, um, I mean, I'm just lucky, honestly. I got to boarding school trope early on what is now a trend. Um, and I generally just like, I don't have another idea, so I wouldn't write another one, but also because I feel that it's like, I don't need to put another book out in a space that has a bunch of other ones that are doing something new and fresh. I wouldn't want to rehash myself. Um, or another example, like, yeah, once you see three or four books, use the exact same trope and thriller in a certain space of time, like maybe you do just take a break, but it's going to be, that's very thriller specific. I think it is a trope based genre. And it's so it's yeah. In fantasy, so much can vary by world. Like yeah. you can have the same trope in a completely different world and magic system with a completely different character. And if you bury or I guess make the trope feel different enough, um, it won't be the first thing that people notice about your story. Because it's yeah. possible in fantasy to immerse a reader into your world and into your magic and make them really forget about the familiarity of the trope. That's, I think, the magic of fantasy, pun intended. Um, but I think, especially in thrillers, I would imagine readers don't want to feel like they can predict the ending. And so if they begin to see a pattern, then yeah. they might say, let me cool off for a while or pick a book that has a different trope in it. So I don't feel like yeah. I know. You have to subvert the trope. Yes. And again, it does depend on the trope. But like a good one, I actually think, example that I think got a little bit saturated was the um alcoholic unreliable narrator in a domestic suspense thriller we saw a lot of those in a very mm -hmm. short period of time and i do think that like saturated a little um but they never die or go away it's just about kind of your choices in the moment um yeah um i just want to throw this up quickly because i think it's a fun question is it okay to really enjoy your own book is it a bad sign like you should be more self-critical no i th i i I mean, I go go in cycles on it, but like, there's always at least one read of my books I do that I enjoy because I wrote it because I wanted to read the story, and then I never look at it again because uh, I can't bear it. it. It's too embarrassing. But yeah, I think you should enjoy reading. Yes, you should, and pat yourself on the back. Just yeah. know, like be sober minded about it. But yes, love your work, love your story. I'm I'm reading through this book before I turn it into my editor in two weeks, and I. Every time I'm not reading it, it's all I think about. I love it. And yet yeah. at a line level, as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, this word choice and oh, this sentence. And oh. so, you know, just balance it. But yeah, no, you should absolutely love it. Um, this is a good question. Uh, what would you say is the difference between writing YA versus adult? Uh, and I know that neither of us have fully ventured into adult, but I know we're both thinking about this. Okay. This very well, question. We both read adults. We both read it. Yeah, we, I read mostly adult now, so which is probably why I'm venturing in that direction. You know, why I read more adult fantasy than I do YA fantasy. The vastness of the world. Um, I, I find on a very s sort of small level, the sensibilities of the characters are a little different. Like in YA, the character, you know, tends to be this sort of coming of age character that's sort of going in, coming into the their adulthood in the world. And I feel like parents can sometimes play a different role. And I think the sensibilities of adult characters are just a little different depending on the audience. Like I'm not thinking YA to NA. I'm thinking of like YA to like a 30 year old main character. I think that's where I see the main difference is sort of the sensibilities of the character and like the concerns and focuses um, as, as how they relate to, to their reader audience. That's the biggest thing that I notice. And then I think in adult fantasy in particular, the world <clears throat> can be a little bit like the, I think the pacing can be a little bit slower. I don't, I think YA has this, and I'm just, this is just my impression. YA has this like urgency about it because there's this idea of like holding the attention span of a young reader who may not be into a super long book necessarily. Um, whereas I think in the adult space, you are, the people picking up your book are our readers. Um, and so they're choosing to pick up that book. And I think that there's a lot more space. I'm again, not an expert. I think there's a lot more um, page count space you might be able to get away with in fantasy yeah. in terms of world building depth and detail yeah. um, because it's adult. <clears throat> more scenery chewing. You can definitely get away yeah. with the more like navel gazing on characters. Uh, but yeah, for me, I, it is like kind of that content and that perspective, like what I, I like that you can be a lot more nihilistic mm. in adult. Um, and then that, I think that's what's pulling me toward adult thrillers specifically. Like, um, 
I like that I can do really like dark, messed up, layered mm-hmm. things that are just frankly too bleak for YA. Not because YA is limited, but also just because like it would be pretty upsetting and odd and weird for a 17 year old to have cause to be that dark and nihilistic about the world where someone who's you know in their 30s and experience so i can just like make it messier but there's also just some themes that don't make sense to explore in a way but you asked about the writing specifically like the the, but that informs the writing so i have dabbled in some of my adult thriller writing i can say specific thriller wise darker sharper tone Mm -hmm. like I have like I I definitely feel there's a little bit more freedom to have your character say and do really terrible things um because you worry a little less about like not lessons because I don't think why it has to be pedantic but I've definitely some of what I've written I was like wow this character is like thinking some really terrible things but it's okay because I'm making them a horrible person it's a whole I find it really interesting I can be a lot sharper in what I write the 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 jokes can be darker more morbid um and yeah I and then there's also just POV and perspective um I'm much more inclined to write in third person same same in fact in my new project and I don't know if this is going to stay this way my guy character um is third person and my main character is first and I do feel like he has because of that I feel like he feels more mature like he kind of edges the line of why an adult he is 18 I believe so or 18 or 19 um but I do think that he exactly what you're saying like that's Mm -hmm. I think the beauty of being in fact I've heard of acquisition passes for quote this is too dark it needs to be adult like as a reason why they think they can't position it in YA. Yeah. What what's pulled me on a specific project um, or pushed me really is I had this thought and I was like, that is oh, no one in YA would ever acquire a book that ends this way. And so I'm like, well, now I'm going to write it as adult. It's going to be really interesting. Okay. I'm your alpha reader for this. Thank you very we'll much. We'll talk about it. It's pretty bleak. Okay. Um, oh, it's pretty bad in a good way. I'm excited. There um, is a way that, that can get kind of serious. Let me plug. Yeah, that. no, definitely serious. But I think it's just like, well, and, and to that end, that's why something like Sadie, you know, I've had people be like, huh? I'm like, no, that is 100% a crossover novel. The the ending pushes that into crossover adult territory for me. Let and me I love it. That's why I like it. book coming out in March, which I think is a perfect example of how you can really push the bounds of YA and give some, you can, your YA can pack a punch. Um, this is Sama Tahir's um, contemporary novel coming out in March. Yes. In March um, on my rage. And as the title suggests, I think that's a great example. If you're trying to figure out, you know, how far can I go in YA? I think it's just a phenomenal yeah. read. Well, we can do, we can do a lot. Like the Ivy is bleak. It's it not, is. But, it feels, it feels but I've had right. pushback right. on that. I, really? Yes. I feel like um, it's so like, I mean, the Ivy's is not, I mean. I well, know. meaning it's, it, it, this isn't a blanket statement. It, it's only select uh, well, readers, yeah, obviously. Yeah. But, you, but you as a writer have to be mindful of this, that you are going to be producing something for an audience that may be split on this, whereas an adult, it, it's mm-hmm. just different because yeah. you're less likely to get people to pick up a book like that um if they know that it's bleak and everyone in it is, in it is unlikable um there, there's a different set of expectations in select adult genre yeah um but in ya i think it's very uncomfortable for people that um someone wouldn't have a positive growth arc that's mm-hmm. the main one people really don't like that and i'm like yeah. oh i like books that i like negative growth arcs personally. And I love it in thrillers. I love it in adult thrillers. Don't you just love like a good adult thriller where you're like, these are horrible people. And oh my God, they got worse at the end. I like that. Do you watch Succession? Um, I am not caught up on Succession. And I I petered out a little bit on the first season. Um, I think I was too deep into pandemic brain, but it's on the top of my list to get back to. It has a lull in the middle. Yeah. 
but it delivers Maybe. at the end of season one and season yeah. two is like candy. Okay. Uh, I mean, but to, I mean, to that end, like if people have stars, everyone should watch Dublin murders. And I know I need to read Tana French. Yeah. It's, it's the first season is the first two Tana French books. And they're all like just dark, like not bad people, but like people who make really big mistakes and it's just yeah. dark and delicious. And I, I just, just love that. that. We watched it. Yeah. That is like, gosh, so much of this, like readers who love this sort of like murky gray, like I love exploring characters like that. And I'm I'm grateful to have space to do that in YA. Um, we'll see how far and, I can push the bounds. And YA has opened up that space. And that space I don't think existed 10 years ago. Oh, and so yeah. I actually think we're really fortunate yeah. that YA has grown in that way. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Uh, but of course, you know, that brings up the topic where my frustration is that it's also pushed out some books on the lower end. And I just wish we would have everything. There Everything definitely is, is no, like, there is not a younger YA anymore. I, yeah, I don't see it. I mean, Grey Bear, I feel like, is, like, super sweet, magnificent, masterful world building. Jordan Fleco is a genius. Um, and it has, like, that sweet heart that's reminiscent of, like, older YA fantasy. But it definitely feels like there's, like, upper middle grade and then there's upper YA. Like the 14 to 15 year old to 15 year old protagonist in YA, I, I have a question. Like, I don't know who that is in modern day. It's never had an audience, actually. 15 year old protagonists have never, 14, 15 year olds in YA has never had an audience. Uh, we've never figured out how to place those books. Yeah. <laughs> I think those kids tend to read it's up. rare exception. They read up. That's the problem. Yeah. Um, and like weirdly, like if a 13 year old is reading up, they'll go for a 16 year old, not a 15 year old. It's just, yeah. they don't want to read about sophomore. No one really wants to read about sophomore year of high school. It's junior, it's freshman, junior or senior. But if it's freshman in this market, that sits on a bubble of upper middle grade. Yeah. It's just, so it's, weird. It is. Yeah. It's changed so much. Sophomore year. Remember when this election came out? I feel like that was like classic YA. It just feels like it's changed. All right. Um, I've got you here for almost two hours. So like there's still like so many great questions, but I feel like I need to like catch up and like we need yeah, to start scrolling think and work toward wrapping up. So I'm gonna apologize to people that I'm gonna have to skip a couple of questions just to kind of um this is a great, I'll throw this up so you can start talking about this while I find the last couple of questions so that we can wrap up. Who would you not recommend a mentorship for? Oh. Who is not in, like, maybe a mentorship isn't for you at Ooh. this juncture. Okay. Because this is Alexa Dunn's channel, I'm going to, in Alexa Dunn fashion, be blunt in a loving way, uh, which we love about Alexa. Um, if you are not ready to take a sober look at your story and, and how it might not be amazing, you're not ready for mentorship. Because at the end of the day, your mentor is picking you because they see something in your work, which is fantastic. But that means you still have a lot of work to do. Uh, for most for most mentees, you still have a lot of work to do. And I find that sometimes, and then this is not a bad thing, but I find that sometimes when we send our work to others, we want to know that we did a good job. And it can, I think there's a different headspace of like being prepared to hear the things you need to fix, to hear what you didn't do well. And you really do need to be in that headspace. There is something to be said for getting feedback that about what you did well. I highly suggest if you have not requested a positivity pass from a friend, you absolutely do it. That is, there is merit there. But a mentorship no process, it's, about growth. it's about growth and uh, so if you're not ready to really do the work, I mean, most of my mentees, except for one, had full rewrites. And when I say full rewrites, I mean down to how do you want this character to change? Like, In fairness, you yeah. love a full rewrite. I do. I don't usually take those on, so it does vary. <laughs> Because I'm overwhelmed. And there's gonna be a there's gonna be a vast difference. But I do think the common thread is you gotta be ready to take feedback. If you are not yeah. like me, working with an editor, it's a collaborative process. I mean, it's your story, but at the same time, you have to be in a place to hear feedback. And then I would say another person who doesn't need mentorship, to be really honest, is if you've had author CPs, writer CPs, you've written a few books, 
if you know in your gut that this story is ready for querying, save that space for someone else who needs yeah. that mentorship and just query. Um, yeah. But I'm so reminded yeah. about that, like being honest with yourself, like, you know, or at least I hope you know where your craft can grow and if you think it's ready for an agent's eyes or not. Um, and I do think too, Alexa, if you want to talk a little bit about this, that the standard of what publishing is looking for seems to be changing. Like, I feel like 10 years ago, like you could sell a book that needed like significant editing. Oh, yeah, now, now you can't. And now I feel like it's like, the book needs to be pretty much not as a debut. I, I think once you have an established relationship, so for, but like, yes, for example, pretty dead Queens, I don't think I could have ever sold that wide in the state that it was as like a partial because it changed so, so much, mm -hmm. but I was able to sell it to my editor because we had an established relationship right. and she knew what I was like to work with. Um, and that's, you know, yeah. And that makes it even harder for querying writers to know because a lot of querying writers don't, I don't think, have critique partners. Like, mentorship is great. Right. But get yourself a writing critique partner. Like, even if you don't get into a mentor program, find fellow aspiring authors and swap work. That I cannot stress enough how helpful it can be to have experienced writers read your stuff and give you an honest opinion. And then you sit with their feedback and really begin to work on honing your craft. Because really... Writing is a craft. Like telling a story is one thing, but like honing your craft is a is a whole nother thing. And that really, I think, is something that having a good CP can push you to do. Well, and, and a huge part of it is just learning to sit in the feelings too. Like part of the reason you want to like get different critique partners, you have to start feeling comfortable with the negative feelings that come and learn how to deal with them healthily, privately, never forget privately we don't we do not flounce on social media everyone we don't we don't don't do it it and and i have to say like i mean every once in a while we all see it where you see someone do a flounce at a professional level where you're like did you not learn to manage these feelings at a lower stakes level because that's what a huge part of it is at least for that's why i advise it it's it's managing the feelings the first time you're ghosted by a cp it's managing the feelings the first time you hear a piece of feedback you really don't want to hear it's going through the process of managing those feelings hopefully well and then three weeks later realizing oh no they were right it's you have to go through that because the stakes are so much higher when you're querying. They're so much higher when you get an agent. They're so much higher when you go on submission and you get an editor and you're training yourself to manage disappointment. You're training yourself to handle rejection. And so actually to that end, we might not recommend mentorship for someone who isn't ready for that, but weirdly applying maybe is one of those experiences you need to go to, even if you aren't ideal for it. Cause I'll say, we look for these red flags on your application. If we, like, we try to be able to tell that someone isn't ready for mentorship and you might not like the rejection, but may maybe it's part of your process. I don't know. Anyway, um, just don't yell at us. We've gotten people sending nasty emails and like stalking mentors. Just don't be a professional. And I just like this question. I'm going to throw it up. Is there such thing as too fast paced for a thriller? Yes, there is. <laughs> um, if it's breakneck, if it's like things happen, things happen, things happen. Um, you always need to have breathing room moments in any fast paced story, moments of reflection. Um, it can't just be change, 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 change. You need like change, reflection, change, reflection. Um, you need little ups and downs. That said, if you're drafting fast, draft it fast. Like, so my, what I'm working on now, I'm pretty sure is a little too fast paced. Don't care. I'm writing it. I want to write it as fast as humanly possible. It's a miracle if someone died at the 7,000 word mark. I can't believe it. I killed someone at 7,000 words. It's amazing. I am so proud of you. I can't believe I did that, but maybe it's too fast paced, but that's a later problem. So that is a later yeah. problem. Yeah. Also send me these 7,000 words. <laughs> it's at 10 now, but yeah. Give me all of them. I will send them to you because I am polishing my proposal. So yeah, I've been working on that over the holidays. So let's see. I need to make sure my opening chapter is not too 
it's very pacey, but I need to make sure it's not too fast. Oh, here, um, because I didn't even like really delve in with you on writing sequels and series. So that can you end a novel on a cliffhanger or should it have a complete character plot arc? I think you can do both of those things. I think, um, I mean, you need to feel like the book is a satisfied meal, but that doesn't mean that you can't be excited for dessert, right? Um, so Wings of Ebony is a great example because in Wings of Ebony, I established two villains kind of early in the book. And this book kind of deals with the first one. And at the end of the book, the very end, like literally in the resolution chapter, um, my character is notified that something is happening and it ends with her heading off to deal with that. And then book two, which comes out in the 11th, picks up immediately with that conflict. But again, it's a different villain. They both were met in, in um, book one. The world was established more in book one. But the focus was very much on the first villain and the stakes attached to the first villain. And in the second book, we sort of segue into the other. So they, it feels like you've had a full meal, but you're like, ooh, okay. What's the second course? Yeah, sorry, I had a cat, like, jump. <laughs> uh, which actually brings me to me, bad at housekeeping. You want to do a book giveaway. Oh, I do. You um, it's not in the live component, so like you've missed nothing. It's going to be commenting on the video once this is done and posted. I'm turning. So, I'm and everyone here gets a jump on it. Okay. You See, can get a beautiful copy of of this book. It's so shiny. See, not only will you get a copy, I'm going to sign and personalize it for you. So because I love Alexa. Do you want them to comment with something specific? Is it like, like, you know, I don't know. Mm, I don't know. I'm bad at this. I usually just say, leave a comment. But like, it's kind of fun. It's like, give give them an assignment okay. for their comment. Complete the this, this sentence. I love YA because. Oh, I love that one. Okay, yes. So you leave a comment below. It. Yeah, you can do it in the comments. And I will put a pinned comment explaining this. So like, Thank you. If, if you're like now like what, but you could win a, a, a personalized and signed copy of Ashes of Gold. Yay. Um, oh, I want to throw this one right, as yeah, well. Internet, it fine. Tips for someone who hasn't managed to write a full manuscript yet. So far, I've only written short stories. My advice would be to grab a beat sheet and really analyze the structure of your short stories and figure out what beats you're really good at writing and which beats are are shorter in your short stories, like beats that you um, get through a little quicker or glaze over a little faster. And then do some short story exercises in writing those harder beats for you. Um, and then try to actually pace out, um, pace out a story like in an outline beat by beat and then try to write each, even if each, initially, if each beat feels like its own little story, that's fine. Because the scene is kind of like a mini story. It's not going to look perfect at first, but like really go into your short stories and analyze what your instincts are naturally. So you can figure out why your stories keep ending up shorter and exercise those, those muscles in those areas that you tend to not write more content. If it's just, if it's literally, you're going through all the beats just really fast then practice writing a scene that's longer, like set a word count, bullet point the conflict, show how the character has a goal, there's a disturbance to their goal, they have a new goal, there's another disturbance, like pace it all out and then write each bullet point um, and just practice, like really just like think of it as exercise. Don't just like jump into a story and say, this is gonna be a long story. Actually like exercise in those areas that you feel like you're not doing as, as long winded as you as you want. And also think about structure, like, uh, or I should say plot devices, story devices that can, that naturally lend themselves to longer in structure. So meaning you're not going to write a quest short story. Quest, you know, bah, 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 is going to be longer. Uh, like, you're not going to have something where there are three, I mean, I guess you can theoretically do anything in a short story, but like, they have to complete a series of three tests that's naturally going to have lots more conflict and up and down. Um, murder. <laughs> Like you have to do a whole investigation with A plots and B plots. You're giving yourself a structure to fit into that you need to write more. Uh, novels just typically have more conflict. 
more conflict, more reversals, et cetera. Yeah. Um, question for you, Jay, any tips and advice for writers who are POC, things that they should be aware of as writers, as debuts, et cetera? That is, Andrea, that is a whole nother stream. The short <laughs> is, Which we could do. <laughs> which we could do. The short answer is um, yes. Um, there are, it's a uniquely, it can be a uniquely different experience for POC writers. I do think the publishing industry is getting a little bit better about these things, but I use the word little very intentionally. Um, publishing is still a largely white industry. And um, the challenge that is in that, within that, one of the challenges is that the decision makers at the table who decide how much should this book be offered on? Should this book be offered on? Who is the audience for this book? How much should we market this book? which readers are going to buy this book, sometimes those decision makers are not people of color. And so because of that, their answers to those questions can be completely off base, which obviously impacts the POC writer. Um, at a querying level, um, I think that you definitely have agents that are interested in POC writers nowadays um, more than before, almost too much sometimes. So just be careful of people adding you to their repertoire versus wanting to advocate for your career. Research very thoroughly how much experience uh, an offering agent has and anyone you send your work to, because there are definitely agents out there, the list is short, that are collecting marginalized writers because they feel like, oh, this is an easy sell. And you that is- the Pokemon agents where you're literally. like- And it's like, this oh. is not what we're doing. This is not what we're doing. Andrea, because I know we're short on time, if you have more specific questions, please DM me on Instagram. My Twitter um, DMs are closed, but please DM me on Instagram. And if you have any specific experiences, um, let me know. Also, yes, the giveaway is open to international. That's fine. I saw that. Um, oh, good. Yay. Um, but yeah, no, the the Whisper Network is important. I know it's daunting to be like, but Jay is someone who's always there to like help authors that oh, you're so just generous with your time and actually really great follow-up question from Lauren. How do you work through feedback on a POC protagonist with an editor? Do, editor, do you ever disagree? Um, I mean, the question of like on a, of microaggressions that come through on editorial suggestions, we've talked about this privately before. Um, I know multiple people who have experienced this. Yeah, This is the, the most important thing there, Lauren. That's a great question. I love that you're thinking about it now and you're aware of it. Because sometimes authors will go into these experiences and we're just so happy to be there that we're like, yeah. we just like, we don't even look sideways when something happens. But I'm glad that you're thinking about that and fully aware of these things going in, eyes wide open. The biggest thing I can tell you is that your agent needs to be your, your advocate and your agent needs to understand that these microaggressions exist um, and that there are possibilities that if, if they happen to you, meaning they exist in this industry, like if your agent has no idea that microaggressions exist from editors to writers, I have concerns about you working with them. Yeah. Um, so that they, they need to back that. you up. Yeah. They can't gaslight you if it happens. No, they have to fundamentally understand that no, this is a real thing. Because if it does happen, you then have an advocate. That's their job. That's how they earn their 15%. You go to them, you say, I'm not comfortable with this. And they should be able to navigate how to handle that. Um, if a specific issue arises and you're stuck on something like that's happened to you that you don't want to say publicly, just DM me on Instagram. Yeah. Um, and I'll also say um, I've even had this where, and it's good that they, sometimes it's good that they, they probe and ask questions about certain things that you've put in your manuscript. But like I've had things, I mean, you've done like accuracy reading for me as well and I've had others as well yeah. where they'll like ping like this and I'll be and sometimes like you has the writer whether it's your own experience but also whether you've had backup readers you just have to be like I mean have I been tempted to be like I can't believe you asked me that yes but like just like stick to your guns and stand up for yourself and know and I have been able to say like I have vetted this with these three people like if I, I mean because we've talked about it before that if you they want you to make this edit and you're like, but if I make that edit, it's actually more racist. And then you explain why I've done that before. <laughs> Don't assume that your editor is an expert on yes. your marginalization. Or that, 
you're a representation or, or, I mean, if you're an, if you're a non POC writer, like just don't, I think there's such a power imbalance between yeah. publisher and writer that sometimes it can feel like, and I, I was fortunate. My editor for my duology um, is a black woman and she's awesome. Um, my editor for some of my other projects are not, but they've also been incredibly um, just sensitive and aware and, and great. So I haven't had to deal with that myself, but I have several friends who have, um, and it's a very real thing. And you just have to know that you don't, you aren't required to defer to their perspective. Like talk, to, it's so important that writers have communion, community and like talk to other writers, say, hey, this happened. Am I reading this wrong? What do you think of this? I literally have, have had conversations with people where I was like, hey, this is how I interpreted this note from my editor. How do you interpret it? And they would give me their take on it. And if we both agree, okay, this is a little weird. Then I go to my agent. So um, have, it's so important to have community, like have people on your side. Yeah. Um, I just want to petition to have this stream happen much more often. A great, I've learned so much on this stream. It's because Jay's amazing. Oh, no. We <laughs> can talk anything. Again. Let's do this again. I love talking yeah. to you. We talk all the time. We yeah. I mean, this, our, this is like what our private conversations are Literally. about. <laughs> we just get more specific where we'll be like, okay, so there's this thing in my book and we're all yeah. like pitching things at each other. <laughs> oh yeah. Um, yeah. Just nine hour reader. Yeah. Honestly, people it's weird when it happens. Like I have like, yeah advocate for yourself and also like obviously it's different if it's an editor relationship it can be harder to walk away from something but honestly if something is really bad you can say to your your agent i won't work with this person again but if this is like a critique partner level walk away from people who do this to you yeah they're not worth your time all right all right okay good i know i skipped over some questions but i've had you for two hours and ten minutes okay Thank you so much. Um, everyone don't forget, I will have a pinned comment, explain the giveaway. So you comment below on the, the co in the comments on this video to win a signed and personalized copy of Ashes of Gold, which is out next week. We're so excited. It, Jay shut off the naked book earlier in the stream. You can check it out. It's really gorgeous. Yeah. Jay, it's like, I call you Jay because I know so many Jessicas, but like you're Jess. Um, oh, it's if so pretty. Can. If you plan to pre-order, let's say you're planning to shoot for the giveaway, but you plan to just buy it, yeah. make sure you send a copy of your pre-order proofs to my, um, I have a post yes. on my social media so you can get these really cool character cards. Ooh, so shout out all your social media. People should follow you. Yes. Yes, yes, yes. Please do. So, and this, all this information is on, on my thing, but if you're buying the book anyway, and you're buying it before the release date, these are free. I will send them to that. you like next week. So these are um, character cards from the book. These are the love interests. That's the love triangle. And there's quotes in the back from each of them. Um, and then Again, my author side, I'm going to ask you who designed those. We're going to have conversation. Oh, the designer. <laughs> I <laughs> love character cards. And then this is a scene from the book. So yeah, just make sure that you get all your, all your free goodies. So everyone have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. Happy new year. And comment below to win a copy of the book. So Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye, Alexa.